podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Yes, we're back live. This was episode 1857, broadcasting coast to coast on the Premier Networks on Saturday, January 8th, 2022. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Are you looking to break into the world of IT? Get the introduction you need with IT Pro TV. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use the code TWIT30 at checkout. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? It's Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yes, we're back live. Took Christmas and New Year's Day off. Hope you enjoyed those best of shows. But uh, we're back answering phone calls and talking high tech for a brand new year. 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number if you want to talk about technology. 888 827 5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can also uh, reach us. But um, you probably have to uh, use Skype or something like that to call. Websites changed a bit. And I want to explain. Explain that, and I know some people are a little disappointed. Uh, TechGuyLabs.com now goes instead of to a dedicated site, which it used to, has been for years since 2004, I guess. Uh, it goes to the main podcasting site, which is Twit.tv, and there's a you know kind of a technical reason for that. We run uh, the both sites on a uh, a content management system called Drupal. Excellent. I chose it years ago. Uh, and we've been running on it ever since. Drupal constantly gets updated, and the latest updates have kind of left the old versions behind. This happens sometimes in technology, and uh, uh, you know we're, I'm, we're kind of using the Windows XP of Drupal. The problem is they're going to stop doing security updates, and we don't really want to run a public website uh, without those security updates. But this will this will sound familiar. Anybody who runs a business, we went to our. Uh, the company that does our stuff and said, well, I guess it's time to update. And they said, yes, that'll be a quarter of a million dollars, please. And I went, no way. Are you kidding me? It's apparently a, a big upgrade. Everything has to be rewritten or something. So that meant uh, either spending a lot of money or since we already have the other site, we're going to update that site. It's still expensive, but at least I don't have to do two sites. Uh, which I guess would be half a million dollars. <laughs> so I'm saving a quarter of a million dollars. So we're gonna we're moving everything over to twit.tv. You'll still have a page for every show. This is episode 1857. That page will have all the links I mention. Uh, we've you know done some interesting things to get those links uh, up there for you. And uh, our editors will put them there. We also are uh, replacing James DeRuvo with a robot. James, our scribe, had been, you know, painstakingly writing each question and answer. But uh, it turns out we can get a transcription program to do that. So we're going to run that. So there will be on every page a list of all the links. So you can just click those. A link to a transcription of everything, which with time codes and everything, and then of course after a couple of days, the audio and video from the show. So I, I'm hoping that that I and already I've heard from some people saying, well, I liked how you divided it up into hours and segments and stuff, and we just can't do that. It's going to be one page per show, but all the information you need will be there. TechGuyLabs.com still works, but just so you know why it looks a little bit different when you go there. Uh, but it is still free, okay? <laughs> That's an important point. It's not going to cost you anything. Uh, so, uh, you know, that I'll foot the bill to uh, for the update. But um, we just really, I couldn't really, I couldn't get my eyes around the quarter of a million dollars. That seemed like a, an awful lot of money. Uh, all right, let's take a look at what's going on in the world around us. And again, these will still be linked, these news stories at techguylabs.com. Uh, so... Fear not. Uh, good news, and we'll talk about it uh, tomorrow with uh, Rod Pyle, our space guy. But the uh, NASA Webb Telescope, the new space telescope, which is on its way to the Lagrange point, it's about three quarters of the way there, uh, has gone through the most difficult part of the process, which is the unfolding of the solar 
uh, uh, shield, and now the unfolding of the mirror. Anything had gone wrong in any of this $10 billion out the window. It's even more expensive than a website. Uh, but everything went well. So the mirrors have completely deployed. Uh, it's in its final form, and now all it has to do is get out there to the Lagrange point. It'll do that in a, about, I think, on the 29th, a couple of three weeks. And then, uh, according to NASA, five months of alignment and calibration. All You know, it's all a little tricky. For instance, you know, it's got to cool down. It's been in, in the hot sun all this time. It's got to cool down, and they can calibrate it and align it. And then... And then we will get pictures of all sorts of interesting things, including the beginnings of the universe. So the battle station is nearly armed and operational. And I can't wait to see what we get. We'll talk about that uh, tomorrow with our space guy. But I just wanted to give you an update on that. Very good news. You remember Google Glass came out, oh my gosh, seven years ago, I think it was. Uh, that was the, the glasses you wore with a little uh, screen on uh, the over your left eyebrow and you could take pictures and stuff. One of the creators has a new project he's working on. It's a smart retainer. You know how <laughs> kids, and they, sometimes adults when you get braces, you have to, after your braces are done, you put the retainer in to kind of keep keep it in shape and you take it out at night and stuff and it's expensive and you know I've spent a lot of time rooting through dumpsters trying to find my daughter's retainer in the in the good old days well this guy one of the creators of google glass thad starner thad starner is uh, creating a uh, smart retainer he calls it silent speller it'll allow <laughs> middle schoolers <laughs> i guess to send texts by spelling out words with your tongue. It tracks the movement of your tongue. They say 97% uh, accuracy for letters, 93% accuracy for words, pretty much like your smartphone. And I, and I, I, Sally, would you like to answer the question? I can't. I'm texting. I'll be right with you. <laughs> It's out of the Georgia Institute of Technology. It's a research project because Starn is a professor there. So I don't, you know, actually there's some real uses for this. I'm being facetious, but there are some real uses for it. people, for instance, uh, who can't, who are in chairs, who can't control their uh, hands or their legs, but can control their tongues. This would be a really great way of communicating. And if you became adept at it, I mean, you could uh, use it for hands-free communication. Anybody could use it for hands-free communication. 124 sensors in the retainer. So, I <laughs> we'll keep an eye on it, shall we? Okay, we'll keep it. We'll let, I'll let you know. CES uh, going on this week. I don't know how big it is. A lot of exhibitors dropped out, but not enough to, to shut it down. Uh, because, of course, of Omicron and the fear that uh, it's going to be a breeding ground, as it is anyway. It's the big trade show. You, you know, in its heyday, 150,000 people from all over the world would gather at the convention center in Las Vegas to uh, trade gossip and inventions and bacteria. Uh, it's pretty typical for somebody to come back from CES with a bad cold at the very least. They, they didn't really do it last year, but they decided, no, oh, it's safe. Let's go ahead this year. I'm not sure I agree, but... Let's go ahead. Uh, so CES is ongoing. A lot of PCs announced. We'll talk about some of the announcements. Nothing really spectacular. These days, uh, tech companies can announce things, you know, via press release, have their own events. Apple's shown the way there, right? Apple doesn't care. Uh, none of the big companies uh, were there. The TV companies were. Actually, I'm very curious. Scott Wilkinson, our home theater guy, is going to join us in about 20 minutes. He was, I don't know if he went, but he certainly was following closely. He had told me, I have been told about a brand new TV technology that's going to be announced at CES that's going to be very important. We'll find out what that is in about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Scott Wilkinson will explain whatever it is. I don't know. I have some thoughts, but I don't know. So uh, another event went went on yesterday the worst of CES this is from the uh, right to repair point of view 
<laughs> some of the worst things announced at CES. And I, th there were a number of different categories. Uh, in the automotive category, I have to give credit to Mercedes, which showed off its new EV, its electric vehicle, the EQS. Uh, when, you, when you're in the car, a warning screen uh, pops up on the uh, vehicle's beautiful big old screen saying, do not open the hood. Only the specialist personnel of a qualified specialist workshop should open the hood. Access by customer not permitted. To open the hood, consult a qualified specialist workshop. Uh, now, of course, immediately... Uh, Somebody on YouTube has figured out how there's a way, you know, there's a panel you pull off and you, there's a latch underneath there. And they don't want you to op open the hood. It's an electric vehicle. You don't need to go in there. Stay out. Okay. <laughs> sure. What, whatever, whatever you say. Um, Cindy Cohn, who was one of the judges, she selected for the worst privacy a smart health monitoring light bulb that you put all over your house uh, that monitors your sleep in the, you know, in the living room, in the bedroom, your sleep, your heart rate, your body temperature all over the house. The, the excuse they gave is, well, we'll put this in grandma's house. So if she's not feeling well, you'll know. <laughs> I have to feel bad. I have to, our, uh, <laughs> our, our, our elders are suddenly the subject of mass surveillance. This is just one more way. <laughs> Uh, Cindy Cohen, executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, said the idea that you need your light bulb to monitor your heart rate is just creepy, weird, and unnecessary. Oh, also, it's not clear what happens to the data. There, are, there may be ulterior motives. There may be ulterior motives. There are three people in the house, two of them in the living room, presumably watching TV. Their heart rate went up when Mannix arrested the criminal. It's, is Mannix still on? I don't think so. Samsung has a new NFT aggregation platform, also an award winner. <laughs> a way to display, sell, and buy your NFT artwork from your ginormous Samsung OLED TV. I don't think that's what Scott's thinking of with the future of television. Anyway, we'll have more, we'll have more uh, CES news uh, as the show goes on. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Scott Wilkinson is coming up. Your calls are next. Leo Laporte. The tech guy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, geeks of all ages, it's time to welcome the unbreakable Kimmy Schaffer. Our phone angel. Kimmy, don't take no Schaffer. Hello, Kimmy. Hello. Hello. An old classic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor Laura decided to take it easy. She worked hard. She was here all she was here during the, the holiday. Time we were gone. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I feel like she deserves oh, all by herself. Oh, I've lonely. been there, girl. I've been there. <laughs> Spend many a holiday that way. <laughs> empty radio station. Yep. I've done that. I've done I that. had somebody eat my burrito once <laughs> on a Thanksgiving. It was really sad. I was. <laughs> Wait a minute. You weren't alone? I was alone. No, there's somebody, somebody inside somebody the house? No, no, no. Somebody at the overnight at the radio station, I had left like half a burrito so that you'd have in the something. fridge for my Thanksgiving meal the next day. That's really. It was gone. Slow. I was. I was. But as somebody who has done overnights <laughs> at a radio station... Are you that desperate, though, I that just you eat say, somebody's half-eaten burrito? You feel so put upon that you have to do this horrible job <laughs> that you feel like a world owes you a burrito. That's uh, all I can say. <laughs> who should I start the show Let's with? go to Daryl in Santa Barbara. Daryl and his brother Daryl and Daryl <laughs> from Santa Barbara. Daryl. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Daryl. Hello, Leo. How are you? I am well. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, I got to tell you something before we start. I am what you might consider a levy leftover. A levy leftover? Wait a minute. <laughs> that was uh, many years ago. Yes, it was. I used to listen to him religiously. Now I listen to you. Uh, he has, I'm sad to say, uh, passed away. Um, oh, I'm but, sorry to hear that. Yeah, he was the original uh, tech guy on KFI. Yeah. 
uh, had had the uh, temerity, the nerve, to go across the street, as they say in radio, to another radio station, a arch uh -huh. competitor. So uh, Jeff uh, became the digital doctor over there. Uh, for many wow. years, he and I were head to head, and he passed away about six years ago. Yeah, so wow, the great Jeff yeah, Levy, who I had been, I had been on his show many times, and I think he was a great guy. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I started off with my little AM radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of uh, okay. radio. It's a small fraternity of us getting smaller all the time. <laughs> Sad to say. What can I do for you today? I want to find out something about something called. Groups Google. Now, here's what's happening. About three months ago, I started getting a, a text on my phone. It's yeah. not from another number. It's from, a, it looked like an email address or a web address. Yeah. And, you know, it had a bunch of different links. Some were porn and adult stuff. Yeah. And I, I just simply... It's spam, as you have in correctly intuited. Sometimes well, it's I just would, spam. Sometimes it's actually malicious. Though those links can lead to malicious sites that'll try to infect your computer. Well, in the beginning, the first two or three times, I just would put stop, and you know I wouldn't get another one for two, three weeks. Yeah. Well, yesterday morning, I got one, and I I put stop in it. I guess I must have not gotten to the very first one that came in because it started overwhelming. Uh, my phone, like Let me tell you what stop does. <laughs> stop, which would in a normal, like if somebody, you know, like your dentist is texting you or a political campaign, stop would normally stop it. To a spammer, all stop does is say, hey, we got a live one. This guy's reading these. So guess what happened? The opposite of stop. There's no, just like there's no point in responding to spam email. There's no point in typing stop to spam or malicious text messages. That's not going to do anything. And, you know, it's interesting. I've started to get a lot of calls. You're this, I got a call last week from somebody saying, oh, what do I do about this? And then immediately after he called, I started getting him too with porn links and stuff. So really, really important. There probably isn't anything you can do to stop this. Okay, these people are not law-abiding citizens. Typing stop is not going to stop it any more than blocking that number is going to stop it because that number isn't their number. <gasps> really? That's not their real phone number? No, of course not. Any more than a spammer's return email is their real email. They're not dumb. They're not going to use a real phone number. They can be tracked down. So they just make up a return phone number. It's being texted from a nonsense number. The point of the message is not for you to respond to it. Actually, if you respond, stop, it might not even go to them, uh, although it sounds like it did in this case. The point of it is to get you to click those links. And in some cases, it's rare, but in some cases, we know of this being po merely opening the text is enough to infect your phone. Now, that's a really important little tidbit that I want to say again. Merely looking at the text can be hazardous. So the only thing to do if you're on an iPhone is once you see a text like that, swipe right and delete. Do not open it. I forgot what you do on Android. Whatever you do on Android, delete it without looking at it. That's the only thing to do. You could complain to your phone company. You should because they're the ones letting these things go through. But there's nothing you as an individual can do. Sorry, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Saying stop <laughs> is like telling a robber with a gun in your face, stop. <laughs> stop. It's not going to stop. Not going to stop. So uh, let me see what Business Insider says. I don't, I think that's link bait. Because I don't believe there's anything you can do. The phone company needs to do it. The phone company needs to do it. And the fact that they're not is really bad. So Business Insider says, I'll save you the link, the click. Don't respond. Well, duh, that doesn't do anything about it. Report them to your cell provider. Okay. But that requires copying the offended message and sending it to 7726. Not going to do any good. I mean, I, maybe it will. I mean, maybe they have some sort of spam filtering. They do, in fact, but they haven't implemented it. 
It's very annoying. There is a system, and all the major cell carriers theoretically support it, called stir and shake, and it was mandated by the FCC. They have to support it, in which they reject phone calls and messages from unauthenticated sources. They don't do it. They ought to do it. They're supposed to do it, but they don't do it. And their rationale is, well, I don't know. They have some theoretical rationale. The real rationale is that often they make money from these. So this actually article has some useful things. They say block specific spammers. You can't block them. And RoboKiller is not going to block them. Um, you, there's not much you can do. If the, you, Probably, I think the one thing, maybe reporting them is a good good idea. So again, uh, the problem is I don't want you to open them, and that can be risky. So you have to forward it without opening it, which I think is not possible. <sighs> but if you can forward it, text it to 7726. That's for AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, and report it as spam. I'll tell you why I don't recommend that. A, if you open it, there's there's some small risk just by opening it. B, it's not going to do anything because what are they going to block? But it is the, the only real power of that is you're letting them know, hey, you're letting stuff st through. Stop it because they don't have to. He's back from a very exciting weekend pretending to be in Las Vegas. <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek, contributor at TechHive.com. Normally, you go to Vegas, you walk 20 or 30 miles, seeing all yep. the exhibits. Uh, mm -hmm. You skipped it last year, and I, I think wisely decided to skip it this well, year. Well, every, yeah, everybody skipped it last year, and I skipped it this year, too, and so did most of my colleagues. Yeah. Very, very few journalists were there. A lot of the big companies, as you know, skipped it. But they still had it. There it was. And they fact, shortened it by a day. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand how that helps at all, but okay. I don't either. I don't either. Um, they don't want to call off these events because they buy hotel rooms. They rent, Oh, they, yeah. You know, it's a huge expense. They've, you know, some of it's insured, but a lot of it will be out of pocket. So they put these things yep. on, even though they're, maybe it would be ill-advised from a public health point of view. We'll see if mm -hmm. people go home from their visit to <laughs> Vegas and bring, uh, bring lots of... Little germs home. Indeed. indeed. Uh, I'm glad you didn't go, though. I, I think that a lot of what you want to do at CES these days can be done online. Absolutely. There's no question about it. And there were some there were some live streamed events. Some things weren't. But, you know, you get you get emails of, of the news afterwards and it was fine. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Samsung had its event online. Uh, Bunch of us. So you had promised, and you couldn't mm -hmm. say anything. You were under non-disclosure agreement to uh, tell us about a new television technology that would be announced this week. Was it? Yep. Did it? And it? Is it? What yep. is it? Yep. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> it's called QD OLED ah. or Quantum Dot OLED. When I so saw the it, Sony uh, announcement... Mm -hmm. I thought this must be what Scott's talking about. That's that's what it is. Yeah. Sony was the first out of the gate with an actual product. Their Bravia will use it. Cur well, yeah, Bravia is their sort of overarching name yeah. for their high-end TVs. Yeah. Uh, but Samsung Display, not Samsung Electronics. Samsung Electronics makes the TVs that you buy. Samsung Display makes the underlying panel technology, just like LG Display makes the underlying OLED technology for LG and everybody else's OLED TV. So if you buy an OLED TV, it's an LG panel, but it might be for Correct. Sony or Samsung or somebody else. Correct. So this, well, this, yeah. so so probably it's Samsung that is making these Q it, OLED, QD OLEDs, yeah. All right. What yep, now? Quantum dot we've heard of before for an LCD <clears throat> for backlights for LCDs. Correct. How does this apply to OLEDs? Well, it's 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 a new application of quantum dots. So, in LCD TVs, you have a you have blue LEDs and a, a layer of green and red quantum dots, and all that light combines together to make white. And then the white light passes through the LCD layer and through color filters. And the subpixels, the little tiny subpixels, have red, green, or blue uh, color filters that give you the full color image. On the uh, same process, more or less, on an L on an OLED TV, except that each little subpixel has its own backlight, essentially. So. The each little subpixel of OLED, the red, the green, and the blue, has its own tiny little backlight that produces white 
light. And then that goes through a filter, either red, green, or blue. Uh, or in the case in the case of OLED, sometimes there's a clear one as well that lets the white light through, give it, make it brighter. Um, and each pixel can be individually controlled how bright it is, which means it can go down to full black, which means that o OLEDs have a better black level than LCDs do. What Quantum Dot OLED does is it puts a blue OLED material behind each subpixel, at the base of each subpixel, and that blue o OLED light um, strikes a, a layer of quantum dot that is either red or green. And then there's a, th a clear one for the, letting the blue light straight through. So this is called color conversion technology. And so it takes blue light from, from behind the little quantum dot layer, and the quantum dot layer converts it to red or green. The uh, results, the, the the benefits are many, including greater brightness, much greater brightness. Because this has always light... been an area OLEDs have lagged behind Correct. LEDs and LCDs is that they're just not as bright. So we don't often right. recommend them for you know rooms you can't darken. Really bright. Does really this bright solve rooms. that? Yes, it does. It absolutely solves that problem. Um, so uh, it, when when a light goes through a, a filter, a color filter, you lose three quarters of it you lose most of the light that's coming from behind it this so it's you, like sunglasses for your tv the, exactly the light, exactly the light the filter is blocking a lot of the light block block most of the light so that's why they're darker that's right and now lcds use the same technology they use color filters but the leds behind them can get much much uh, brighter okay so you can lose a lot of light and still have a lot of light coming forward oled material doesn't get as bright intrinsically therefore you lose a lot of light it doesn't it's not as bright and it's you have to use it in a dark room this solves that problem quantum dot color conversion is like 98 percent efficient <gasps> wow so you're losing almost no light at all. Wow. Um, so it's it's really quite remarkable. And uh, so we saw one product actually announced at CES, and that was from Sony, interestingly enough. Uh, Samsung Display, for some reason, we don't know why, gave Sony first dibs at an actual product. <laughs> Samsung didn't announce one. But, but, they, but they made the panel for the yeah. Sony TVs interesting. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So is there going to there might not be a huge amount of difference between Sony's and other companies when they announce theirs? Probably not, okay. although all those companies are going to say, oh, well, uh, the big difference with us is our processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's other stuff. The other stuff. Yeah. yeah exactly. So how expensive are these much more expensive? We don't know. Sony didn't announce. They didn't announce didn't availability announce or price. Uh, OK, nope. Nope, they didn't. And okay. certainly Samsung didn't because what Samsung, Samsung Display, which is where I first heard of this, and I was under NDA to them, and, and they said, you can't talk about this to anybody. Uh, they uh, they just announced that, yes, we have this panel. Okay. But they didn't announce a product. Right. So have you seen these uh, QD no. OLEDs? No. Nope, not yet. That's I why you to. go to CES, by the way. So th exactly that little extra right. bit of information, you can actually mm -hmm. say, I've actually seen it. and Actually actually it. put eyes on it, yeah. 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 yeah, we didn't get to do that, but the technology itself is interesting enough. And I've known about it for several years. It's been coming down the pike. But as Mike Heiss in the chat room said, it's gone beyond being a science experiment. Well, it's also it's confusing now because uh, Samsung's been selling QLED TVs, which are LCDs lit, mm -hmm. backlit by quantum dots. Quantum dots, correct. And, they, and I think they chose QLED because it kind of looks like OLED. Correct. But they're not. They're LCDs. Uh, That's right. That's right. It's a marketing always, thing. We've always liked OLED. Mm-hmm. I always prefer it, we always, unless you have a super bright room. Yeah. We always told people, well, you know, it's not QLED is not OLED. But now it is, in a way. Q, the quantum dots have come to OLED. <laughs> Correct, correct. And would you say way. once we see the pricing and so forth, that this will be the OLED display technology going forward, the way to do oh, it? Oh, yeah. 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 Because it absolutely. solves that problem. It uh, solves the brightness problem. Any other? Exactly. Does it solve the burn in issue or the blue issue? There's some, well, you know, Mike Heiss just, or somebody, maybe it wasn't Mike, some, somebody just sent me in the chat room an article, a link to something, something about 
uh, burning issues with QD OLED on the Sony. I have no idea that they could even have had it long enough to test that. Yeah. But I'm going to look into that because that I hope that's not much of a problem. Another thing that it actually improves, believe it or not, is viewing angle. Now, OLED viewing angle is already really good. Yeah. Unlike LCD, which you have to be standing almost right in front of it to get the best picture. Right. But OLED, you, you've got a wide viewing angle. This QD OLED makes it even wider. So I guess the bottom line is it's coming. We don't know how mm -hmm. much. We don't know what other issues there might be. But we'll keep an eye on it. And I bet you by the end of this year, we'll start to see our first QD Absolutely OLED no. TVs. Oh, yeah. Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Geek. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to stick around? I'd be very happy to. Okie dokie. I'm a giving you your screen. Thank you so much. And with the, uh, the clock is very good, too. Go get yourself a cup of joe. Um, I shall. I shall. So that's interesting. I mean, I, um, I didn't realize there was a filter layer on OLEDs as well to be honest mm -hmm. with you. So, yeah. So that's in front of the panel? Correct. And the and the only difference between, with well, the real, the big difference between OLED and LCD or, L, or LED TV is that in an LCD or LED TV, the backlight is one continuous plane. Yeah. And its brightness is controlled by the darkness or lightness of the LCD shutter layer. With an OLED TV... Basically, each subpixel has its own independent backlight. Tiny, tiny, tiny little white light, which is actually made up of a stack of blue and yellow OLED material. Blue and blue, blue plus yellow equals white. So the so, native OLED display is not a color display. Uh, I thought because I thought it was direct. Not view. in that sense. We were looking. It at is direct pix pixels that were actual color, but they're not. They're not, not. They're color filters. They're colored, and then the filter, they go through a filter. Right, but they don't go through a shutter. Unlike LCD, LCD has a each subpixel. It's a passive it's filter? A, it's just, yeah, it's just a red filter, a green filter, or a blue filter. Oh, so each pixel the, has three filters over sub three Subpixels. Okay, three subpixels, red, green, and blue. Right, and actually in OLED, there's a fourth one, which is white. And but then so then they must be opened and closed, no? No, no. The the OLED material behind each filter is darkened or brightened electronically. Okay. And so the OLED material behind the color filter can be electronically taken down to zero, which is how come they get full black, or brightened up to some maximum. But how do it know Else which color? <laughs> I don't understand. Oh, I see. <laughs> There's really four different OLED pixels, and they can brighten red, green, and blue. Uh, independently. Independently. Got it. Yep. Yep. Exactly Got right. Got it. So the OLED is, in fact, shifting. Uh, the filter isn't. The filter, Correct. all three, all four filters are always active, always going always, on. Always, always, they're static. They're just, and so it you know, just, like, like putting a just, filter up in front of your eye. Yeah, I get it. So it just brightens the portion of the screen behind the appropriate, a certain amount to, to get the proper yeah. color. Correct. It's, H, it's Correct. hue, saturation, and luminance, or whatever. It's, yep. you see, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the, again, the difference is be, that, be, in OLED, there's all you have a to tiny little luminance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all you have to change is the luminance, and yep. then you can do that by sending different amounts of electricity yep. to each to the OLED material behind. I did not each realize subject. that. I did not realize. Now, why does this improve viewing angle? Uh, that I'm not a hundred percent sure about. It has to do with the fact that color filters actually affect the viewing angle. Yeah, clearly. So and these when are you better. Do, when you, yeah, these somehow. are better because there's no color filter. There's no filter. Oh, there's no filter at all. There's no filter at all. Oh. The, the, the blue light behind the red subpixel is stimulating the red quantum dots to glow directly, to emit directly. Wow. There's no color filter whatsoever. Pretty amazing, actually. It is amazing. Yeah. yeah. What a technology. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's most exciting thing that's happened uh, in TVs in a long time. Yeah. And the cost will be roughly tied to how hard these are to make initially. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and and the quantum dots now are being inkjet printed. So they may be. So it, it may not come out of the box so hugely expensive, 
possibly. It may. It may. Yeah. Because inkjet printing is cheap. pretty cheap. All right. You want to stick around for the top? You bet. Our show today brought to you, our podcast today brought to you by IT Pro TV. I know a lot of people who listen to our shows on the network are, uh, are like enthusiasts, tech enthusiasts. And I think many of you perhaps have thought, boy, it'd be nice if I could kind of work in this field I love so much. Maybe you're thinking about getting into IT. This is the place to go if you're looking to break into the world of IT. Partly, uh, there's a conundrum because there's IT means a lot of things. You know, we think of IT maybe as the desktop support person at your company who comes around, you know, and fixes your computer. And that's one kind of IT. The person who sets up the network, that's another kind. Person who secures the network, another kind. All of these are, you know, positions that are in high demand, so they're really good jobs. And they're a lot of fun. But you got to figure out what is it that you like to do? What are you passionate about? IT Pro TV can help. They help in a lot of ways. They have the counseling and the, career, and the uh, to help you figure out which IT career path you want to choose. But you can also take courses in a variety of areas and see if they if you like them. Because when you subscribe to IT Pro TV, you get kind of access to all of their courses. And man, they cover the waterfront of IT. 5,800 hours of on-demand programming in every area of IT. They do all the certs too. By the way, a lot of times when you're trying to get that first job, you get you'll you'll they'll say, well, you need an A plus, for instance, A plus certification, or a network plus, or security plus, or uh, maybe you'll need an Azure, Microsoft Azure certificate. You can go to IT Pro TV, get the training you need to take those tests. They even have practice exams you can take. They have if you're if you're studying uh, how to configure Windows servers, for instance, they have virtual Windows servers you can run in your browser and do all the work. You don't even need to have any of the hardware. Uh, it's a really great place to learn. And it all starts really with their edutainers. Uh, experts in the field, they start by being IT experts, but who are expert at communicating. That's what makes IT Pro TV so good, so fun. It's it's like our, uh, it's like it's like Twit, but for, for IT professionals, for getting the certs, if you already have the certs, for recertifying, if you've already got a job in IT, v, IT but you want to expand, for getting new skills, to update your skills. I just love IT Pro TV. Every month in the last six months, they've been doing themes. January is perfect getting started in it month they have a free weekend next weekend january 15th and 16th so if you want to dip your toes into it listen to the courses it'll be free comptia they're the official training video training partner of comptia so they have some great comptia courses they do the itf plus those will be free and the a plus those will be free this coming weekend linux essentials uh, MS-900, that's Microsoft 365 Fundamentals. Hands-on PC build from the bench, that's just fun for everybody. Uh, Cisco CCT routing and switching, that's 100-490. That's the CERT uh, uh, information. Uh, if you want to be an ACSP, Apple Certified Support Professional, they've got that for the latest Mac OS. These will all be free this weekend, next coming weekend, January 15th and 16th. I think IT Pro TV is fun. I think it's easy. They they divide. They they have studios working Monday through Friday all day, so there's always new content. They want to keep everything fresh. It goes from studio to library in, in 24 hours, so it's there right away. Uh, everything is divided into 20, 30 minute segments, so you can do it during lunch hour. It's very convenient. You can watch anywhere too. By the way, they have apps for every device. Um, the content is up to date. The certs are up to date. I think they're just fantastic. If you're getting ready for exams, you can take those virtual labs, the practice tests. Uh, also, they do these monthly webinars. These are also free. January 13th this week, they'll be discussing Cloud Computing Confidential, Secrets to Leveraging the Cloud in Your Organization. So there are plenty of companies who have not yet moved to the cloud for lots of reasons. This would be a very good webinar. Maybe share that with some other members in your organization. If you're looking to break into the world of IT or if you're already in IT and you want to get better at it or get a new job or new skills, IT Pro TV is what you need. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off your consumer subscriptions. For the lifetime of your active subscription, just use the code TWIT30, TWIT30. That is a great deal, 30% off forever. Go to itpro.tv slash twit, use a code TWIT30, an additional 30% off as long as you stay active. It's still 30% off, and that could be for years. 
I just think these guys are great. Big fans, Don and Tim and the gang at IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Don't forget that free weekend is coming up. ITPro.tv slash twit. The offer code twit30. Now back to the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I want to go back to the spam text message issue because it really is a problem. It's going to be more of a problem. Uh, the FCC uh, implemented something called Shaken and Stirred and required this protocol. This, it's an authentication protocol uh, to be adopted by phone companies. And it was it's intended for robocalls. But I'm going to guess, actually, maybe I shouldn't guess, that it also would apply to text messaging because text messaging is tied to a phone number. So shaken, uh, stir and shaken should uh, be also used or could also be used, I would think, uh, for messaging as well. And the idea is that uh, a phone company could say, look, uh, I am only going to accept phone calls from authenticated numbers, from an actual number. And that really cuts down on spam because, as I mentioned earlier, spammers don't want to use their phone number <laughs> to call you or text you. They spoof them. And if spoofing isn't allowed, in effect, that should severely limit them. Um, the, there's a little problem because uh, the companies are dragging their heels to implement this for a variety of reasons, mostly financial. You know, they, they, they kind of make money off of these calls and stuff. So <laughs> uh, that's one problem is that the phone companies, the cell companies, which probably could do a much better job of blocking this, uh, text spam, as well as robocall spam, um, is slow to implement this stuff. The FCC is going to make them, but they keep putting off the deadline. So what can you do? I'll put a link in uh, the show notes, techguylabs.com, to a PC Magazine article by Lance Whitney uh, just from a few weeks ago, how to block robotexts and spam messages. But I want to caution you a little bit because not it's possible that some of these methods will not work. <laughs> And could even expose you to malware. So as I mentioned, even the act of opening the message can be dangerous. You know, ideally, you don't ever even look at the contents of the message as soon as you see it. And you can kind of tell if you look at your incoming text messages, you can kind of tell there's a problem. You should at that point either delete it or if it's possible, forward it to the phone companies. I don't think this is going to do much good. They do have a special short code, 7726. That's spam, if you look on the keyboard. Uh, and it works for AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. It maybe will work for the other uh, smaller companies. I'm not sure. But so, so you forward it. Now, to do this, I would not copy the message. I would not open the message. I would just forward it. Now, on Android, you can long press it and say forward. I suspect you can do the same on uh, Apple's messages. You don't, yeah, see, when I long press it, it opens it up. So this advice, while, you know, maybe good advice, is some is potentially risky. How did, so, so I should explain why people are sending you these messages. It's not so that you'll respond to them or text them with stop. Do not send anything back to that message. That's just a signal that there's all, we got a live one. This is a real phone number. Keep sending them stuff. Do not, even if the message says, send zero to stop or text stop to stop. Ignore that. That doesn't work. That only works with legitimate non-criminal texters. You know, if it's, but if it, you know, if it's an advertiser, political campaign, if it's a store you frequent, whatever, stop will work. I'm not saying it won't work in those cases. But the problem is this criminal spam. So texting back to them is not going to work because it's not a real number. Uh, opening it is potentially dangerous because there have been known flaws in the messaging programs on iOS and, and on Android. When they render a message, that renderer that they use, if there's an image in it, for instance, sometimes has a bug in it which could allow a bad guy to get into your phone. So it's potentially even risky to open the message. We call this a zero-click exploit. There aren't very many of them. They're very valuable. They're primarily used against by nation states, by, by governments against dissidents and journalists and terrorists and that kind of 
that their ilk. It's just sad that I have to <laughs> lump dissidents and journalists in the same bunch as terrorists. But that's those are the three groups not related uh, that often get targeted by governments. Remember, we talked about the NSO group and their Pegasus malware. Well, the way they would get the malware on your phone is with a zero-click exploit. The problem is, you know, they're, these things are few and far between. They're very expensive. So usually it's only nation states that can afford to do this. So it's a low risk. Uh, the, the images and so forth are not low risk. And there have been some widespread cases of text messages with images or weird Unicode symbols in them crashing your phone. It's a short step from crashing your phone to taking it over. So you really don't want to open these messages. You don't want to display them. You don't want the renderer to work on them. And frankly, even the, the, no, the preview that you see might be sufficient. That's why this is a big problem. Now, the, usually the real payload on these, if they're not a nation state, if they're not a government trying to hack its, its uh, dissidents, is the link itself. They want you to click the link. Maybe just because they want to drive traffic to a porn site, but maybe because that site has more malware on it that if you go there and your browser will be activated. So whatever you do, whatever you do, do not click the links. Do not follow it up. Even if it says you've just won a million dollars, click here. To That's the whole trick. You've fallen into that trick. And, and so I think for the phone companies, for T-Mobile, Verizon, and Wireless, say, hey, just forward us the message. It's a little risky. It's a little risky. Uh, if it's just link spam, then it's not risky. Do you want to take that risk, given the fact that there's probably not a lot going to do happen because of it? Because they, already the phone companies don't care. They're not doing much. Um. Should you if you if your phone company offers spam protection, take it. In most cases, these are it's free now. There are third party uh, programs you can buy buy like RoboKiller, which is thirty bucks a year. Problem is everything you get has to be forwarded through these services. It's like a filtering system, and then they look at it and they say, well, it? you know, the good news is by doing that, you're probably eliminating a lot of it, and you're not going to have the risk of seeing it, so it's not going to impact your phone. It costs money, and it's not going to be 100% effective. Uh, there is a free service called Spam Hound. kind of works the same way. Uh, the folks who do RoboKiller often offer a free uh, program you can use on your phone called Text Killer. It's more like a spam filter. It looks for certain words in the texts and uh, blocks those. And it will learn from your actions if you say this is spam. But again, I'm, I really don't want to recommend opening up these messages that could be risky in and of itself. In my opinion, the, the, unless you're completely bombarded by them, the best thing to do is delete them. If it comes from a political campaign, a store, a business, something more legit, stop will work, and stop is the right thing to do. Sometimes it's hard to tell, though. And if it's a criminal, if it's a criminal, stop is just going to be like saying to a guy robbing you, hey, stop. It's not going to do any good might even irritate them and it will certainly give you more messages i'll put a link uh there is you know this is how to block robotext and spam messages from pc week or i'm sorry pc mac in my opinion uh you know all of these things have some value but it's always not it's not guaranteed that they're going to help and in some cases they could even hurt I, I wish lance whitney who wrote this had put a little more information in about that uh, we, you know, and really the, the blame completely falls on the phone companies, the cell companies. They need to do a better job. This should not be happening. You know, I think they've, they've hurt themselves badly. For a long time, nobody wanted to uh, answer the phone. They made the phone less useful as a phone because of robocalling. They finally started to take that seriously. Now it's become less useful as a spam, as a uh, text messaging tool because of spam. We got, I really think we should fix this. Uh, I honestly think this is their problem, and and the FCC really needs to hold their feet to the fire. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We'll take more calls in just a bit. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. And now it's you, Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek. Puerto Rico is the new go-to destiny. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, hon. 
as it happens, my lovely wife Joanna is here and wanted to say hi to the chat room. Hi, Joanna. Sort of speak- hi. Hi, everyone. Hey. Happy New Year. Hope you're all doing well. Happy New Year to everybody. We are up here in Santa Cruz getting our new temporary house set up and ready to go. Getting oriented, and it's a wonderful, wonderful, sunny, clear day here. And uh, we just hope everybody stays safe and healthy and uh, we get through and have a have a happier year. Indeed. Look how many people are saying Happy New Year to you. Great. Got the wrong glasses on to read at this point. <laughs> give my aging eyes. Damn glasses. Look, it's Mrs. Home Theater Geek. <laughs> oh, and Phoenix Warp One loves your blue streak. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, my ode to re- it's my ode to semi-retirement. No more dress codes. No more dress codes. Yay. <laughs> well, there you go. Have fun. Thanks. <clears throat> so... Happy New Year to you all. May it be better. May it come in peace and health for everyone. And Dr. Mom, Grandma, let's hear it for working in bunny slippers. (laughs) Yes, no more more dress code. Phoenix Warp 1 says we are so cute. Thank you very much. Oh, and Big Island AH says Happy New Year to both of us. From Hawaii. (laughs) Happy Ortho Christmas, indeed. Thank you, yes. uh, We're enjoying it up here very much. Uh, Leo said that uh, Petaluma was kind of gray and cloudy, but it's gorgeous, gorgeous here. Um, Alan Gabriel, best TV at CES, besides QD OLED. I don't know. I haven't digested all of the information yet, and I had, didn't see any of them. So it would be difficult to um, to make that determination. I'm going to read the best TVs of CES. A couple people in the chat room have uh, produced links, have sent links on uh, from articles about best TVs at CES. Um, I'm certainly most excited about QD OLED. Uh, but TCL introduced a 98-inch mini LED LCD TV for $8,000, which is, you know, half the price would normally be. So somebody else in the chat room asked whether or not uh, these 98 inch and 100 inch TVs were going to replace projectors The projectors are going to go bye bye. And uh, it, you know, if the prices keep coming down, then yeah, could, could very well be. Um, Phoenix Warp, Warp, one says, congratulations on your retirement. She was a speech pathologist, still is, but she worked at a hospital and uh, retired from the hospital. So, um, Mac Bookie says, 83-inch OLED or 100-inch short throw laser projector for a cinema room. Now, a cinema room, uh, if, if it's a really a dedicated cinema room and you can paint the walls dark and control the ambient light very well, a projector still has a, a, I think, a good place in such a room, and uh, you know, at at eight thousand dollars, a ninety-eight inch TCL uh, is going to look pretty good and and pretty comparable, probably. Projectors, except JVCs, don't generally have very good black levels. Uh, the Epsons have pretty good black levels. The JVCs have excellent black levels, um, but you're going to spend. 8,000 bucks probably on a good JVC projector with screen. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, once the pricing of those big giant TVs come down to a certain point, uh, I think uh, whoever wrote me that earlier about, will that, will that kill projectors? Eh, not entirely. There's something to be said for a projector in a dark room as being more cinematic. The LCD TV is going to be so bright that you're going to, you know, the future is so bright, you're going to wear shades. Um, M. Heiss, Mike Heiss says, I doubt it for a variety of reasons. Also, Hisense said they have an 8K native tri It's not native 8K. I, I'm pretty sure it's a DLP with a quad 
pixel shift. I, I'm not sure about that, but I think that's what it is. Um, and that should be very interesting. You're exactly right. Retro G says uh, they're practically give Walmart's practically giving away 55 inch 4K TVs. That's true. Um, Beatmaster, what are my thoughts on the HDMI alliance saying HDMI 2.0 is now always labeled HDMI 2.1? If that's the case, I'm a little surprised because they never wanted to use those numbers in the first place. Uh, they really don't want to use version numbers, but maybe they've finally succumbed. Um, that's a very good question. Let's see how much time have I got left. Oh, if, I got three minutes left. Can you? Yeah, you get a long break because we don't have an ad at the top. If you want to mm -hmm. stick around, we have a caller who has uh, wants to ask you about the Q OLED, QD OLED. Sure. Okay. Sure. So keep going and then uh, stick around after. Don't hang up right Okay. Away. Okay. All right. <laughs> Beatmaster at what high sent me a link to what hi-fi any HDMI connection can now be labeled as HDMI 2.1 and that's not okay I would agree any HDMI connection uh, you know I guess does HDMI 2.1 have to have 48 gigabits per second bandwidth I don't know I have to look at I'll have to look at uh, at that a little more closely uh, web 9303 what are all the direct view video technologies lessee i don't know what that is crt plasma qd oled anything else well direct view uh lcd uh at lessee probably means lcd lcd crt plasma oled and then qd oled i would make a distinction between those two um i can't think of anything else that's direct view. Uh, rear projection TVs, <laughs> uh, when they were around, they're long dead, but I suppose that might be. Let's see. Scooter X says, uh, Hisense HK variant of the trichrome TV, trichrome, I don't think it's trichroma, is powered by an 8K imaging chipset with embedded artificial intelligence that combs through every visual scene pixel by pixel to optimize the picture, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I still don't think it's native 8K. I think it's DLP and it's, it uses pixel shifting. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. You didn't mention LCD TV. That's the other direct view. Um, the major one these days. Uh, in Hollywood, uh, yes, uh, we are moving north, but I'm still going to be doing Tuba Christmas LA. I'm going to, I can do it all remotely and all I have to do is fly down for the day. So that's, I'm going to continue to do it because it's so near and dear to my heart. There's just no two ways about it. Um, yeah, these big, big flat panel TVs. The other thing about big flat panel TVs is that they consume a heck of a lot of power. Uh, so that may be another reason why projectors might be preferred is that they don't consume quite so much. Scooter X, I can apply for a passport to return to LA. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> uh, Maverick 56, uh, what's the best TV I own? Do I own a lot of TVs? I don't own that many TVs actually. Own. Oh, I've had a lot come in and out. My Sony OLED is my favorite. It's the best one by far. Uh, when I can get a QD OLED, I probably will. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Let's talk high-tech computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, anything with a chip in it. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, Dave is on the line from San Diego, California. He's next. Hi, David. Hello. I had a, a question for Scott Wilkinson. Is he still there? Amazingly, Scott I'm has still never here. left. <laughs> <laughs> no, we saw that. I saw I that you, never wanted to, leave. you wanted to talk to him, so I thought I'd get him to stick around. He's very Excellent. kindly done. I have so. a, a um, uh, what do you call a crystal ball I'm looking into, and I see, Scott, your future, you're going to get that A95K uh, mm -hmm. OLED uh, <laughs> QJ. 
uh, quantum dot. But my question is um, has to do with the company that makes the um, quantum dots, the Nanosys. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. years and years and years, they have been putting on their website about this ultimate goal that they were shooting for called electroluminescence, which is they mm-hmm. don't use a backlight, a blue backlight. They were using electrical fields to stimulate the quantum dots to do what quantum dots, what we, should, what we love about quantum dots to do their thing. Have they yep. achieved that goal? Because when I went back onto their website, they changed everything. They changed everything about it, the look of it and the way they uh, talked about it. So they what? have added QD OLED, I noticed, to their roadmap. Oh yeah. So now oh, they're yeah. now they're being honest about it. But uh, it's interesting because yeah, their roadmap. Uh, Nanosys again is the company that makes this quantum dot. Uh, the actual quantum dots, that the little using. microscopic yeah. and the film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And then their website, they start with, on the roadmap with QDEF. Uh, then QD OLED. The next one is micro LED. I didn't realize quantum dots were involved in micro LED production. They they can be. You can put quantum dots inside of a of a micro LED. And then nano LED, which I guess is smaller than micro. I don't. <laughs> I don't print. They want to. They want to unlock the possibility. They say of printing low cost, durable, and flexible displays that can wrap any object, big or small. That's kind of wild. That's flexible, and and we've seen flexible OLEDs. Uh, do, in the in the uh, roadmap, do they have actually electroluminescent I don't, quantum dot? I, I think they like, t- they they take that out. It looks like they took it out, David. It That's down. very interesting they because they they have talked ago. about it for years. You're exactly right, um, and I'm sure that 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 will happen. I, I've talked to to Nanosys. I know the people there pretty well, and uh, they said. Yeah, we're still working on electroluminescent, but it's still several years away. They have yeah, done it. Five years ago. <laughs> is it a, I know. Is it a I display know. technology? Well, how well, how yeah. would it be a, yeah, yeah. used? Oh, it, it, it could be... Thing. I'm sorry? It's more of a power efficiency thing. You guys are talking about, not on the air, but I heard you talking, and you said something, somebody had texted you about how the power consumption for these panels is, like, really great. If... Uh, uh, if nanosys could achieve electroluminescence, it, power consumption would go way down. In other way words, down. a very efficient panel, way down. Yep. And they wouldn't yep. need a backlight. They wouldn't need all this filtering processing. It would, yep. it would be yep. the best thing. You Even could simpler. By the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, uh, one other thing I wish you would do, and you could do this on Tech Hive if you could for everybody, is just could you just explain the difference between micro LED, macro LED, and that thing that <laughs> came up with, which was the mini LED? There's mini LED is, too, yeah. yeah. And then right. apparently, yeah. according yeah. to uh, Nanosys, there's nano LED. There's so. going to be nano LED. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can do that. Sure, sure. That's a good idea, actually, please, to please. explain what those are. That actually leads hey, uh, into my other query, which is. In years past, we've said that micro LED would be the future of uh, television. You, is that no longer the case? You think? No, I, I think I think micro LED has a definite place in the television universe. It's a direct uh, view, like OLED, yep. but it has some yep. advantages. It also has some disadvantages. It's much brighter. Uh, it can be any size you want. You can make giant tiles. video walls. Yeah, make giant video walls, which you can't do with with any other technology, really. Um, and it's super expensive, super expensive, because the placement of those micro LEDs has to be so precise and perfect. You can't have a single error. So, so what I think people want, let's think about this. What do they want a TV? They want big. If we can mm-hmm. fill a wall, you know, like in science fiction, great. But, great. but we also want it to be bright and vivid. And in other words, we want it to look like a giant glass window to another mm-hmm. world. Which micro LED does? Micro LED does that. Okay. okay, already does. But if you got a million bucks, yeah. Well, <laughs> all these things come down in price. David, did did that answer your uh, question? It's an interesting question. Pretty much, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's uh, perfection is a moving target. Uh, Scott, have a great uh, new home environment, you and your wife. And uh, thank you, you, Leo. Have a good day. Thank you, David. Have a good day. Mike Heist, your colleague who is in our uh, chat room, Scott. Says yep. He thinks yep. Samsung may not actually use Nanosys films and, and quantum dots. They made they bought a company that another company that they they may also be using instead. They did, but I must I thought they did. You know, I'm going to have to go back and look at that. I'm not 100 percent sure. It's you know, I mean, look, uh, there's also the question of how good 
does it have to be? At some point, I'm talking about with this with Aunt Pruitt, who's our photography guy on our uh, podcast, yeah, yeah. our hands-on photography. He says, at some point, uh, you know, the, the TV screen is as good as your eye. It doesn't need to be better than you can Correct. perceive. And it sounds Correct. like we're getting Correct. close to that, to be honest. Oh, we're, we're beyond it. 8K, 8K is beyond that range, I think. Yeah. So, so, so if we're going to make progress, it's not necessarily going to be higher resolution. Right. It's going to be, be greater color. Or or things like wrapping everything in video screens, or <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, yeah, uh, that's not a TV. That becomes a different application. I'll give you an example. We were at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. It's a wonderful hands-on, oh, great place, experiential museum, and they mm -hmm. have one of their displays is a giant moon. It's huge. It must be 30 feet in diameter sphere. It's hanging there, and it looks like the moon because projected onto it are satellite images of the moon. So it feels like you're looking uh. at a giant giant for a room, but not as big as the real moon, but a big moon. And it's very detailed. It's very vivid. Um, that's an example of... But it's of, not built. It's actually it's images. It's a projector, projector on an yeah. actual sphere. There is a sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, yeah. But that's what the kind of thing electroluminescence could do. It could bring video to all kinds of interesting surfaces. Correct. I think, I think that's Correct. kind of an intriguing uh, idea. Yep, um, I agree. Especially for advertisers who would like to put advertisements on every surface in your house. <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, Home Theater Geek, thank you. It's always great to have you. I, I agree you with bet. David. I'd love to see an article just kind of running down all these different uh, technologies. It's uh, it's. Uh, that sounds like a great idea. I'll, I'll start on that right away. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Scott Wilkinson, it's nice. He sticks around uh, after uh, his uh, segment and, uh, and is often uh, available to answer additional questions, which is really great. 8888-ASK-LEO. I'll tell you what, I'll go, I will get one more call in here before we take a break. Gloria on the line from North Hollywood, California. Hi, Gloria. Hi, Leo. Hey, it's good to talk to you again. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. My problem is that I tried to sign up with UMA to get rid of the AT&T bills. Um, a technician came over. I'm sorry, let me get, I'm getting ahead of myself. UMA set up the service, and they said that they could port my landline number. As soon as they ported my number, everything went off. The phone... <laughs> yeah, so Uma, we should explain, is voice over the internet. Uh, and so that means instead of using those phone lines, you'll be using your internet connection to make phone calls. In the transition, it sounds like they they uh, disconnected, when you ported the number, they disconnected your, your traditional Ma Bell phone. Uh, and maybe they hadn't connected the Uma right away, so there was a period of time where you lost service, it sounds like. Yes, I wish I had known that. Yeah, anyway. that's always a risk. But, you know, it's hard to know how to do that otherwise, unless you get a second number. Oh. Anyway, <clears throat> the company that I had the internet service with wouldn't let me back in. They wouldn't let you back in? They said that they wouldn't let me back in in the same, under the same service. Oh, you're on DSL Extreme and they want you to use their true speed, don't they? Right. Yeah. And when I went to, I said, okay, after crying for a week, I said, okay. The technician came over. He went outside to look at things, and he said, I have bad news. He says, this building that you live in it's was too probably old. built in the 30s, yeah. Yeah. and we can't help you. So there are two ways people get Internet, typically. One is through the phone lines, those copper lines coming into the uh, house or the apartment building. And, uh, yeah, many of them are very, very old which means the quality is not good, but also true speed requires two phones, phone numbers, four wires, and they maybe couldn't put another pair of wires into your house. So I think I suspect that's what was going on. So he couldn't offer you that service. It's, it requires two phone lines. Well, he mentioned something about a Cat5 cable. I don't know what Well, that's that another way you could do it. it so the I said there are two ways you to get... You don't have it here. That's no, you problem. don't. No, there's two ways to get uh, internet. One is the phone company. That's usually the worst way. The other... Well, actually, there's more than two ways now, but there most areas there's two ways: phone company and cable company. Can you get uh, internet from your cable company? I have satellite. Okay, That's but you but you may have cable available to you in your neighborhood. I bet you do. 
I'm so ignorant about this. No, I understand. You don't have to get TV. Cable implies to people TV. It's not just TV. Oh. You don't have to get TV from the cable company. You can just get internet. You can get, there's three services they offer. All of them are basically data services. There's TV, there's internet, and there's phone service. Uh, they'll try to upsell you. They don't want you just to buy internet. They hate that. But you can just buy internet from them. And usually it's more expensive, much, sometimes $60, $70. And usually it's also much, much faster. The problem with Uma is going to be, in order to do voice over the internet, you have to have a pretty decent internet connection. Well, I canceled Uma. I was so yeah, I don't think, yeah, it might not have worked very well on a phone, you know, on DSL. Certainly not on a two-pair DSL. Um it might have, but I'm just saying it might not have. So now you're without internet and phone service? Oh, no, I have the phone service. I called AT&T oh, to tell them to whatever. Yeah, keep and your I AT&T. I down on everything that they were offering me, including uh, caller ID, everything. I wanted everything stripped down. Um, I have the phone service, but I haven't had internet all last year. Yeah. Because every company I call... If I mention the Cat5 cable, which is what this technician told me when he came in to look things over, they said, we can't help you. So there's newer ways. I'm, I'm going to have to take a break, so hang on, and I'll hand, help you offline. But there's newer ways to get this. Wireless is probably your best bet at this point. T-Mobile and Verizon offer cellular-based wireless. Uh, Elon Musk's Starlink offers satellite-based wireless. There, uh, your satellite provider probably offers wireless internet as well. So there are other internet choices nowadays besides the phone and the cable. For years, phone and cable owned that space. Um, but hang on, I'll, I'll help you a little bit off the air. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So you haven't had internet in a year, Gloria? No. Oh, dear. The technician came here. He says, what you need is to have an electrician come over here and set up the wiring. He said, and the owners would have to pay for it. And I thought, that there's no way. I don't even want them to know that I'm doing this. They're not going <laughs> to pay for it. It's an older house, and the in, in, what I think they're saying is that the inside wiring is inadequate. Yeah. Um, do you have, have you noticed there's a, a, a cable drop anywhere in your house because i you know everywhere in north hollywood is on the cable system i would guess well i've tried to talk to everybody in this building is new i've been here for so long everybody is <laughs> is an apartment it's an apartment building yes okay and i've come to realize that when you move you don't take the internet company with you unless they can set it up where you're going yeah yeah they're really geographically restricted so that's the that. one thing to ask is look for your your younger more tech savvy neighbors mm -hmm. <laughs> well, they have mentioned, I've asked three people. Ask them what they do. Yeah, what do they do? Yeah, they, uh, the all three said Spectrum. I yeah, that's cable. Goodness. Oh, that's cable. Okay. Um, so that's good. What that means is that's available to you. I'm almost certain your apartment has, it will look like um, a phone, little plastic phone uh, jack, but instead of phone, it's got like a cable, a cable, a coaxial cable coming out of it. That's a cable drop. I would look in your bedroom and living room for that. If you've got that, then it's a call to Spectrum. They mail you a thing that you connect to it, and now you've got Spectrum uh, internet, Wi Fi. Any other suggestions? Um, so that's one way. The other thing to do is to check with T-Mobile and Verizon. Both of them are selling residential cellular service now. So they similar idea. They have a little box. You put it in the window, though, because it's got an antenna. It's a Wi-Fi adapter that is getting Internet from the cell tower. And because you're in an urban area, there'll be a cell tower near you. You might actually get very good service. If you go to T-Mobile uh, and their web, well, you can't because you, <laughs> you don't have the Internet. Yeah. You could see what a disadvantage, why, how important it is that we have universal internet. Yeah. You just get left out. Um, so T-Mobile does offer um, residential internet service. And uh, so does Verizon. And so it, it depends on your neighborhood. So you're going to have to call them. And give them your address and say, can I get this in my neighborhood? And then the most important question, how much will it be? Yeah. So w between that and the other one, that you, Spectrum, that you mentioned, I mean, uh, what would you think would be a 
good solutions. Some well, and some of this is budget. You don't need probably a super high speed, right? You want to be able to do email, right. surf the net, you know, do your banking, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So some of this will be how much do you want to spend? Um, the nice thing about DSL Extreme was it was very inexpensive. Yes, and they said that the people who are still with them can continue as yeah. they are, the older people. The problem is they ride on AT&T's phone lines or whoever owns right. the phone lines, and, and AT&T does not like them. They're only doing it because the FCC makes them do it. Oh. So there's this tension, and, uh, and I think what DSL is trying to do is move everybody to a, a better service. DSL is not a great service. But if you, only, if you are fine with DSL speeds, you're not going to find anything for 20 bucks a month anymore. Right. Right. But if you can spend 40 or 50 bucks a month, then I would check with T-Mobile or Verizon. Do you have a cell phone? I have a free cell phone, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. minimal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have a lot of data. No. Yeah. Um, I was willing to pay the AT&T to sign up with DSL Extreme's new, but again, that's what They that can't do it. Yeah, yeah. They can't do it. I think Spectrum is probably your best bet. I would call them and see what it would cost. Now, is this wiring like it used to be, where they come into your apartment and set up cables on your floor? And no. Oh, okay. No. That's why I mentioned that cable drop on your wall. Hey, I got to run, Gloria. Uh, call Spectrum, and then maybe price compare with T-Mobile and Verizon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888-827-5536. Uh, actually, Gloria, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Uh, she mentioned, you mentioned that you're uh, on a subsidized cell phone, yes. which means you probably can get subsidized internet as well. Now, I've just made this a lot more complicated. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, and it, unfortunately, the, uh, the Congress has not renewed this subsidy plan, so it went up 10 bucks. But there is a subsidized internet uh, plan, and I'm not sure where you go to get uh, the subsidized internet. Let me just see if I can find that. I have access to the internet here, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it's, and of course, it's, an, it's a website, but let me see if I can find a phone number. The uh, subsidy, uh, as I said, Congress uh, lapsed, so now um, it's not as much as it was, the congressional uh, allocation. Um, uh, let's see, who can you call? Spectrum does have it. So when you call Spectrum, say, I, uh, I have a Obama phone, and I want to get subsidized internet. And that might be as little as $20 a month. Oh, wow. So it is worth calling the cable company. Okay. Okay? That's the only one that you suggest, though, just... I think because that's what everybody else in the apartment complex is using. We know it works. Oh. We I know mean, it works. Subsidy. And the subsidy would... Actually, it's $15 a month for the first year. Okay. But you have to be a recipient of certain public assistance programs. Right. I suspect the subsidized phone is one of them. And Spectrum, no T-Mobile for a subsidy. Uh, T-Mobile does it as well, I believe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Verizon does. Anyway, yeah, this is, the good news is there's a little more competition in the Internet space. It's, thank you so it's much. It's just starting. Gloria, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for hanging on. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's uh, you can see. I mean, how <laughs> how do you how do you find out how to get subsidized internet? Well, you go online. Well, wait, I don't, I'm not online. How do I do it? You can see how it's a disadvantage nowadays not to have any internet access. And I and I really I think it's a shame that Congress did not uh, renew the subsidy. It's really important. But there are ways to get low income internet service. Spectrum has one. It's the Spectrum Internet Assist Program, and that's her local cable company. So that's the first place I'd start. It's part of the FCC Affordable Connectivity Program, and it can save you as much as 30 bucks a month. I think that's a big deal. And we need to do more, even more. I mean, this is becoming, it's like water or electricity these days, right? We just need it. David's on the line from Santa Clarita, California. Hi, David. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Hi, Leo. Great to talk to you. In fact, I think it's a phone call 20 years in the making. <laughs> well, it's about so, time. Uh, Welcome. Yes, it is. No, actually, um, about 20 years ago, I went to a very sketchy little neighborhood to watch a taping of the screensaver. Oh, my. And 
And Patrick was there and all the gang was there, but you were shirking your duties. Actually, I'm sure you were. <laughs> I was, I'm so trip. sorry. I apologize that I wasn't there. Yeah, that we were in the Potrero district of San Francisco. It was a sketchy neighborhood, but I'm glad you made it and saw it. That's cool. I, no, it, it was I'm sorry awesome I missed you. Time, but, uh, I still have a uh, T-shirt that has a spot for your signature next. next well, we'll, we'll signature. arrange for that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty no, years I, later. I, I really <laughs> yeah, but I really appreciate your uh, being here today. Um, listen all the time. Normally, be a podcast uh, with my son on the way to school. Nice. So uh, he'll get a chance to hear this later. Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, my question for you is. Um, so I use my the iOS camera app a lot for just you know although I you know like taking nice pictures every now and then the family scenery, but I use it actually a lot more for just very mundane blah stuff. Oh, here's my parking spot. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then the other thing that I use it for or want to use it more for is I do a lot of resale stuff, you know, eBay, sure. online, you Perfect know, for that. Places. Yeah. and all those apps have like their own built in camera portion. But if I want to do it on multiple ones, it, it's easier to take it in the camera app and then load them back. in. Yeah. Use Apple's so photos. Things? Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to have to take a break. Thing. Hang on just a second. got to take a little break for the bottom of the hour. Johnny Jet travel guru is waiting in the wings. We'll do a little Johnny Jet and uh, take more of your calls. 8888-ASK-LEO. Sorry about that. The network never rests. Oh, no. But I'm still here and the, pod the podcast is still here. So if you listen, what's your son's name? Uh, Timothy. Hi, Timothy. Hi, Timothy. <laughs> he's he's going to be in for quite a shock. Actually, they're doing their... I don't know. Are you familiar with First League Robotics? Oh, he's in First? In that. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, and today's their big day because they announced the new game. So he's at you know a massive session at school there. You know, oh, how exciting. They just found out what the new game is. Yeah, I'm very proud of him. And, uh, you should yeah, be. Do you, do you get to help out at all, or does he have to do it all on his own? So it's kind of an interesting dynamic there. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, it's hard for me to be involved in, um, because of some commitments I have here, although I'd love to. I, oh, I tell so him all cool. the time, son, I was born about 30 years too early. Oh, I know. First is really, really cool. And uh, yeah. Steve Wozniak, friend, old friend, was very involved in the beginning of First, uh, was a coach, I think, down in uh, San Jose. Uh, and oh, they have some uh, awesome schools from the Bay Area. It's really, really it's, uh, cool. Dean came and founded yeah. it. Yeah, really great. Um, so cool. Firstinspires.org. If people are curious about it, your school, yeah. every school should do it. It's just a wonderful uh, idea to get kids into science yeah. and technology. And the Robo Warriors are looking to uh, do excellent this year. So good. Had a tough year because of the because of the pandemic last year. Nice. Yeah, uh, they were lucky they got to go to one competition and then yeah. the whole season had to fold. Oh. It was really sad for a lot of the, especially the older kids, you yeah. know, who were yeah. looking forward to that. You want me to wait until we're back on the air for the... No, go ahead, ask. And uh, I'm, I'm, oh, sure. I'm basically, I think I'm going to say just use Apple's Photos app because uh, that's well, so I well integrated in. Why don't you want to use that? Well, no, I actually, I don't mind using the Photos app. Here's what I'm looking for. I'm actually looking for an alternative camera app because here's the thing. And it, 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 it almost feels petty, but so a lot of times it's like, oh, hey, I want to take a picture right now on the fly, blah, 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 you know, three, four, five. And then the problem is after you take, you know, those five, six, seven photos in a row, getting them into it's just the management afterwards. It's like, okay, then I got to open this, the share panel, click here, click here, click here, move it into a separate album because otherwise then I end up with a whole bunch of photos that I don't want in the general camera role just because. Oh, so you, you know, just want a camera app that has its own role, not in, you don't want it in iPhotos particularly. In some ways that would be good, although a lot of the apps depend on being able well, to. That's get the thing. Share has to work. Either. Yeah. 
So there's right, certainly, right. there is no lack of uh, third-party camera apps for the iPhone. Right. In, in almost every like case, those. they're more complicated, not less. Exactly. And someone recommended Camera Plus, and I actually haven't done it yet. I've been chatting with the developers, but it's a slow process because it's just a couple of days. That's the that. old solution. That was one of the very first third-party camera apps. In fact, uh, yes. I know the developers pretty well. I'm glad to hear they're still doing it, to be honest with you. I think it's, uh, you know, and I may have given you the wrong name being very awesome, maybe Camera 2 Plus or something okay. similar. Okay, okay. But and I haven't done because like I know it sounds petty, but you know it's a ten buck download, and you know I don't I don't like asking for money back, you know. But yeah. they didn't have enough in there to tell me this is the feature I you know that I'm looking for because ideally it would be like, hey, those last ten pictures, one click to here, here's the album they should go into. Because especially a lot of times I'm doing this one handed. So really, what you're looking for is not so much a camera app as what we call a DAM, a digital asset management app. And honestly, yeah. the best one on Apple's uh, platform on iOS is probably Photos. I don't know of yeah. a lot of other damn choices. The nice thing about Camera Plus is um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it has its own camera role. So at least you're separating it out. Hang on. I got to yeah. gotta go do Johnny Jet. Hang on. Hey, Johnny. Hello. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thanks for the chocolates. Those are good. Harry oh, and David glad. chocolates. Yeah. Thank you. He's been everywhere, man. He's breathing the mountain air. Johnny Jett, our travel guru, travel better with technology. He helps us every week do that. We haven't been doing a lot of travel in the last couple of years. But America's come back to traveling TSA numbers through the roof, right, Johnny? Well, they're 1.5 million yesterday. Uh, the, uh, two years ago, pre-pandemic was 1.7, so we're pretty much on par. I think it's 82 percent of what we were pre-pandemic. So, you know, this Omicron is not deterring a lot of people. Although it did deter my family and I. We we're supposed to be on a plane right now to Hawaii, and oh. we postponed it because uh, all of our neighbors are sick. I, and I have some friends who are pilots and flight attendants. And they're like, this is not the time to go right now. Yeah, Just the, num wait. the COVID numbers are through the roof. The good news is for vaccinated people, especially if you're boosted, uh, it seems to be mild. Nevertheless, nobody wants to get COVID. And, especially uh, when you're traveling and when you have little kids, yeah. uh, one that's unvaccinated. They're not vaccinated, yeah. Well, I don't blame you. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's funny. So how that's why we postponed In the it. first round of COVID, it, not every, few of us knew other people who had gotten it. Now everybody knows a lot oh. of people. Oh, my God. I, I, honestly, <laughs> I, I know at least yeah. 50 people. It's also become a problem because there aren't pilots, there aren't uh, flight attendants, there aren't bus yeah. drivers, truck drivers, there aren't waiters. A lot, so many people are out sick. Uh, that everybody's hobbling along. So that's another reason maybe not not to travel. Lisa and I are going to well, do a local, we're going to drive down uh, to Carmel-by-the-Sea, spend a couple of nights there, drive back. I feel like that I can handle, uh, you know, instead of going to an airport and all that stuff. But that's not till next month. I think it's going to get better after. I, I do too. Through, I, I yeah. do too. And, and we didn't cancel it. We postponed it. So, and right now, if you are traveling, no doubt that you've seen all the numbers. Cruises are, flights, uh, are being canceled too, right? They are, but you know what? I have friends that say they still much rather be on a cruise because the, the cruise ship with the most caseloads, I think, was Royal Caribbean with 4,800 passengers, and there were 48 cases of COVID. That's only 1.5% yeah. of a caseload. Yeah. Compare that to any other place in America. That's really low, and so everyone on the cruise has to be uh, vaccinated. And if they do, and they test all the time, if you, and if you do test positive, they quarantine you. And so it might be safer. You know, we're going. Uh, we still are doing our Twit cruise, our podcast uh, cruise for all our listeners uh, to Alaska in July. <laughs> I uh, I'm thinking maybe by then everything will be a little more back. Listen, to normal. even if it's not, people are managing it, and. Yeah. Um, Honestly, yeah. I have friends right now on cruise ships, right now. We were supposed uh, to go on a cruise, Lisa and I, in about three weeks, but but it started in Hong Kong. You can't get into Hong Kong. <laughs> you can't. And if you do, I was just reading a story this morning about, you know, if you it's test crazy. positive in Hong Kong, yeah. you have to go to the hospital and you stay there, even if you keep testing, yeah. um, even if you show no symptoms. Yeah. There's a three-week quarantine for foreigners coming into the country. That's why they canceled that cruise, I'm yeah. sure. 
Uh, but there are still a lot of con countries open. We have good friends. Uh, uh, Michael and his wife are going to uh, Carnival in Venice next month. You can get some deals right now. By the way, I was just looking. Hawaii, one ninety nine round trip from the West Coast from now until the mid of mid March, and then it only goes up to like two thirty eight round trip. Yeah. So I really so, guess it depends on your your uh, your tolerance for risk and. Uh, and I think a lot of people are obviously traveling, uh, taking advantage of this. And then some Definitely. of us, like you and me, staying at home. But that's, you know, everybody gets to choose what they want to do. Yeah, um, I mean, if you don't have little kids and you're healthy, uh, you know, I, I would I would be traveling right now. But, you know, I can't take a chance with little kids. Yeah. Oh, I don't blame but you. Yeah. because of this, you know, last year is one of the last year's hottest travel trends was trip stacking. What's that? We might have talked about this. Uh, trip stacking is when you have a you know, you want to go to your dream vacation. Let's say you want to go to Europe, but because you never know what's going to happen with COVID. I mean, these days, entry requirements for countries just change on a dime. I mean, you really have to keep checking all the time. So what you do is you have a backup plan. So you have a backup trip. So in case Europe is not going to work out a few days before you cancel that trip and you do your backup, which is might be Florida or Hawaii or California, something ah. that's not so... Um, not so difficult to get into those places or not so risky. And this way you don't lose your vacation. You don't have to stay home. And if you, you know, as a travel advisor and they book you refundable fares and hotels, there won't be any problems. Or you can just wait to the last minute and then just start booking, um, at least for your hotels. I would wait, but I would book your flights in advance. And when you do book your flights in advance, make sure you're booking on a U.S. carrier because in case, let's say you don't go to Europe, because of COVID, you know, instead of booking on Air France or British Airways or Singapore Airlines, whatever you want, you know, at least you can use that credit to go somewhere in the U.S. if you book on United American Delta. So keep that in mind when you're booking these international trips. It's, you know, although I love international carriers and, and for the most part, they're better than U.S. carriers in terms of, of, you know, service and luxury, depending on which ones and which class of service. But this is the safe bet right now. So, <sighs> okay. What uh, what and, other advice do you have for us? And, well, and because today, because it's early January, I always tell people, make sure you go find find your passport, look at the expiration date, and find out when it's expiring. Because a lot of people find out last minute that, you know, it's going to expire in June, and, you know, it's May, and you're going to really have to scramble. And the State Department's already advising four to six months in advance to do it. My, so, da my daughter had uh, an up-to-date passport. She couldn't find it. She was going to Mexico for Christmas with the rest of the family, but she had her passport card. She found out when she got to the airport, the passport card's only good for land and sea travel into Mexico. Yes. So she had to fly down to San Diego, take an Uber to Tijuana, to the, there's a bridge, a land bridge, yep. across into Tijuana, which actually goes right to the airport there. It does. So she walked into Mexico, used the, the passport card worked that way. And then flew the rest of the way to Cabo San Lucas for uh, Christmas. It's smart. It works. It's also it's also a way to save a lot of money if you live here in Southern California because yeah. uh, it, the fares out of Tijuana are usually much cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, now somebody in the Uber on the way back said, "Oh, you can fly into the United States with the passport card. You just can't fly out." Is that true? That I, I told her know. take the land bridge. I, I, don't listen I, I, I to the don't, Uber I, guy. I, I, you know what? <laughs> It says on those passport cards, only good for land and sea travel. Yeah, I don't think so, but Into because Mexico you're an American citizen, yeah. they have to let you in. Yeah, they may but, not like it, and they, and they may make you sit and you're cool in your heels for a while. The big challenge will be getting on the plane because right. the, uh, the the gate agents will be like, sorry, no. you don't have a passport? Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to be the problem. But once you get into America, they have to let you in if you're a U.S. Right. citizen. She had a bit of an adventure. It, was, it, was, it worked out fine. It was a... Uh, kind of an interesting trip yeah, yeah. And, and also another deal it's expiring today uh, costco and hawaiian airlines you buy a 500 hundred dollar gift certificate for 450 dollars. so you get 50 dollars off if you're flying hawaiian actually they also have it for alaska airlines and southwest but the hawaiian part expires today are hotels cruises airfare are still pretty low because of COVID or have they started to come back to normal levels? Oh, no. Right For right now, they're so low. You can fly across country, you know, LA to New York for, you know, $100 right now. Yeah. So they're super low. 
this is the time actually under a hundred dollars each way. Yeah. yeah. So this is the time if you're going, if you're healthy and, or if you've even had COVID before or recently, um, you know, you're going to get some really good deals. And New York City, by the way, has a deal until February 13th, 22% off uh, select hotels through their tourism board, New York City Go. Um, I'll have to tweet that out and I can send it to you for your show notes. Very nice. You can find out all about traveling, even if it's just to dream of travel someday in the future, by going to Johnny's website, johnnyjet.com. His newsletters are free and absolutely a must subscribe, johnnyjet.com slash newsletter. He's also Johnny Jet on Twitter and Instagram. He's got a podcast. He's even got a YouTube channel where he asks travel questions. And I think you've interviewed me twice for your YouTube channel. I have. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go for three. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, Johnny, safe travels. Great to talk to you. You too. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, two weeks we would have been uh, on our way to Asia, but I guess that's not going to not going to happen. I, listen, I just got my TripIt notification that my departure oh, I know. I hate those. was leaving. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh man. man. Right now, we would be we'd be almost in Hawaii, and we we're just jonesing to go. But Chat room says friend. that the positivity rate in Hawaii is 20% right now. I think yeah, you made crazy. the right choice. Yeah, yeah. Def, I, I, There's no doubt, but it's still, I just dream of Hawaii. I know. And, I uh, love it. I feel lucky that we kind of, you know, there was this kind of, interim between delta and omicron where we right. went to hawaii went to mexico we you know we kind of skated by without a problem uh but now i just think you know driving to monterey is going to be the the highlight of our trip we're fortunate to live in california yeah i mean we well, got it all what, here yeah so lisa and i uh you know we've, we said okay well we're just gonna see some of the sites in our area and go to some of the best restaurants in our area and enjoy that I mean, do you know any people around the world dream of going yeah, to California? I know. And, I know. you know, for years, I didn't even know where I live in Los Angeles. So, because I was spending most of my time traveling internationally. How many people who live in San Francisco have never been to Alcatraz or Pier 39? Or people up my way have been on wine. I did my first wine tour a few years ago. <laughs> I've lived in the wine country for years. So. I grew up 40 miles from New York City and I'd never been to St the Statue of Liberty. There you go. Neither, I'd never been to the Grand Canyon. I was born there, neither have I. I have been to the Grand Canyon, and I love it. Yeah, I want to go. These That's are these nice are my trip. bucket lists. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, our uh, our, our engineer Russell, who likes is a fan of the death defying, went to Budapest. Spent the last two weeks wandering around Budapest. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't get sick. He's fine. It, it, it's a beautiful. Oh, a I beautiful love Budapest. City. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Especially at night and going up the, the Danube and oh, isn't that oh. a beautiful? Yeah, Lisa and I really want to do repeat that river cruise we did uh, Amsterdam did you do the, to Budapest. Did you do the Christmas one because we did a no, Christmas one. No, that's that the one we, we did. Multiple. The Christmas markets is the one we want to do. Yeah. Well, they're great, but they're cold and yeah. but there's less people, so that's the nice. That thing was about a good it. time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I don't know. I I you know I feel like we're all gonna get it now. Uh, it's just so contagious. It's just inevitable. All of my friends who've had it are all fully vaccinated, and I think and most of them are boosted, and almost all of them have been mild cases. Yeah. Not all, but almost. Yeah, that's the problem. Not all. Uh, I have two, two two people I know who are not vaccinated, who are anti-vaxxers, both of, both of whom got it over Christmas. Whole family got it. Fortunately, uh, you know, no serious complications, but they were pretty sick. Same thing with my yeah. one of my good friends. He, yeah. He's not an anti-vaxxer, but he's against his vaccine, and his kids were really sick, like 104. Yeah, see, I don't, uh, I, I don't want to take the chance. No, no I don't want to lose my sense of taste and smell. The other night, we went out to a restaurant on uh, Thursday night in San Francisco, and I woke up that after the meal. Guys, I think I've lost my sense of smell. Oh, no. <laughs> and I rolled over and I, I sniffed Lisa's head and I said, oh, no, I didn't. I'm okay. <laughs> oh, I hope it was a good smell. It was good. No, 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 no. Yeah, I like how she smells. It was good. Oh, God, I can still smell my wife. I'm okay. I'm fine. Uh, but it was funny because I woke up in the middle of the night going, I've lost my sense of smell. That's my new diagnostic. I, I, I'm always sniffing and tasting just to see. Does the coffee smell good? Oh, I guess I'm okay. Well, Dr. Mom will tell you more, but I think it's more a, a scratchy throat, this this one, the Omicron. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't go in your lungs as much, apparently. But Which uh, I have, yeah. Oh, no, she says yesterday. Omicron is not nuking the sense of smell and taste. Oh, 
Not as much yeah. or not at all? Because my son... I think, I think it's more of a sore throat. So Henry's got it friends. for the second time. He's fully vaxxed. He's gotten, gotten COVID twice. I figure he's got to be immune by now. You, uh, you would hope. One would hope. I have, mul I have multiple friends who've had it multiple times. At least twice. All right. Thank you, Johnny. Take care. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number. Before Johnny, we were talking to David in Santa Clara. Thank you so much for hanging on, David. David, uh, and I think this is not an unusual request, actually, which is why I want to spend a little time with it. Uh, takes a lot of camera phone pictures, but he wants uh, an easy way to kind of manage the ones he takes for personal reasons, whether it's business or, you know, just parking spots, uh, aside from the stuff, family photos and so forth. Is that is that accurate, David? Is that an accurate description? Yeah, that's pretty close because, yeah, I like we discussed a little bit, you know, I'm familiar with how to use the different albums and photo, but basically it would be ideal to within the actual camera app itself. Which right. This is a big, do it. just kind of pre tag it. Like, Hey, these next 20 pictures, just throw them in, in the trash pile because, you know, I'm not going to need them. Cause what ends up happening is then, I forget to do it, and then later now I've got to go and see A lot of junk in there. This is a big category on desktop. It's called Digital Asset Management, or DAM. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Lightroom is famous for this. Every photographer has to deal with it. There's Capture One. There are more, far more choices on the desktop, even back to, you know, yeah. programs like Picasa, from, uh, which Google killed, unfortunately. But I don't know of a, yeah. a, a lot of uh, choices on um, either Android or iOS. iOS... Probably because Apple's Photos is does do that. The one thing I might point you to is Google Photos does do something kind of interesting. Google's Photos, which you can use side by side with Apple's Photos, you can just turn on the feature that says, when I take a picture, upload it. Uh, the nice thing about that is it's now available on the web. It's available everywhere. And they do some classification. In fact, one of the things they do is directly in response to what you're talking about. If they see receipts... Uh, screenshots, there's a whole category of things that they then will say to you the next time you open Google Photos, hey, I see all these photos. I'm betting you don't want to keep these in your main album. You want to, Should I move them to the archive? So that's kind of nice. That's using AI to kind of understand what your pictures are. And then... I don't know if those photos by default go into the camera roll as well or into photos. So the, the workflow in uh, on the iPhone is, 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 yeah, on iPhone the workflow is photos first and then if you have Google Photos installed, you can turn it on that it will also upload to Google Photos. So you have them in two places. The, ca the categorization only occurs in Google Photos, not in Apple's Photos. Um, Apple, I would imagine, because of this feature, will soon add something similar. They're they're always trying to have feature parity with with Google. So I wouldn't be surprised if at some point Apple Photos said, "Hey, these look like you know, <laughs> I don't know, they're not junk photos. Uh, they're um, something else. I don't know, pictures of things you want to keep but don't want to have in your photo album. I don't know what." Yeah. So, so uh, back in Philly's telling me in the chat room, you can search on receipts in Apple Photos, but I don't know about the automatic uh, categorization yet. Google does that, but I don't know if Apple. Does. I don't think Apple does that. So they're both getting smarter. This is AI. This is uh, this is image recognition built into the phone or uh, in the service, and and they're definitely getting better at that. Okay, well, I, I don't know of any camera program that does it. Um, if somebody does, give us a ring. Uh, we want a, a camera, a camera program for iPhone that does, does better digital asset management. And I, I don't, off the top of my head, my no, no. And this is one of the problems when uh, uh, Microsoft does this with Windows or Apple does it with iOS. When they have a program built in, it's rare that you'll see somebody try to compete directly with it because everybody has the free version already. And Apple makes this doubly rare because Apple also has the right in their app store to reject any app that duplicates functionality that's already on the iPhone. So if you came along and said, you know, I want to make an Apple Photos that's better, you know, does the same thing only better, they'd say, yeah, no. <laughs> you can't put that in the app store. So, um, yeah, I, I, there are lots of camera apps, but managing the photos, thats I don't know of anything that does a good job of that, Dave. Lex, Richmond, Virginia, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Lex. Good afternoon, Leo. Thanks for having me in. 
I've got maybe a low tech question this time for you. Sure. It's the new year, so I'm thinking about doing plain text journaling, and I'm sort of excited about getting into it. I love that. Uh, I do that every January. I plan that. And by January 30th, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I, I always want to. Everybody says it's such a good idea. Keep a journal. No, nah, I don't know why. Well, I'm a I'm a fountain pen guy too, so I like writing on paper. Mm. In the past three plus years, I've used a, a paper journal. Very I nice journal. I mean, my my planner as well. Yeah, calendar planner. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to do it on plain text for a while, and the beauty of it is just you can open it anywhere on anything. But I, I fear uh, select all. Any key, if you know what I'm saying. You can, make, you can make it all go away with just a key. <laughs> so you want to pro... So uh, I, when you say plain text, you mean you are going to do this on a computer or phone. Exactly. But you, far, not, with your, not with your beautiful fountain pen on your beautiful handmade Japanese paper. You're going to do it on the computer. That, by, that, by the way, that's a big step right there. Yeah. The advantage of it is it's searchable. It can exist on many platforms. It can persist, for, you know, for a long time. There's not just one copy of it. So I think there are advantages. It's not as aesthetic. Right. Uh, my suggestion, um, I, the, I'll tell you the program I love and use is called Obsidian. It's hmm. it's a free to use from obsidian.md. And the MD tells you something in the website. MD stands for Markdown. So it's plain text, but Markdown is an additional kind of language within plain text that lets you indicate in plain text, this is bold, this is underlined. Uh, but more importantly, this is a link. And this is one of the things Obsidian does very well. You go double bracket, type a word double bracket. You now created, like a wiki, a page that is linked to that word. Hmm. And for some kinds of note taking, that's really valuable. If you write a lot about cooking, for instance, whenever you type the word recipe, you can make that link to a recipe box. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. So that is a feature you can't obviously do very well in handwriting. Obsidian, though, is plain text. And now here's why it answers your conundrum uh, it's immediately saved locally. But there is a, it also has a sync feature that's very fast that will sync to, and Obsidian works on Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, and Android. Hmm. So it will automatically sync to all those platforms. So even if you control A, delete <laughs> your entry there, uh, it, 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 it keeps versions. It will, it'll still exist. There is, wow. uh, are you on iOS? I'm a uh, Windows? Chromebook, Chromebook and Android phone okay. user. Okay, so Obsidian's on uh, uh, Android. I don't know if it works in the browser. I don't think it does. Hmm. Let's think of another solution for Chromebook. What uh, about just Google Docs and then save yeah. it out once a week to a text file? That's a great idea. Google Docs also does versioning. So if you accidentally delete something, you, I'm pretty sure you can go back and say, before I did that, <laughs> what, what did it look like? Well, they've, they've got that go back button that is yeah. my hide. Y yeah, exactly. So Google Docs would not be a bad choice at all. Uh, that has a lot of the same advantages. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Can I hit, hit you with another quick question? Sure. Importance of VPN if you don't leave home much? <laughs> I would say zero. So okay. um, there is a, it's interesting, Brian X. Chen just wrote an article in the New York Times saying, do we really need VPNs anymore? And he makes a pretty strong case that because most sites are now encrypted, you probably, a VPN is of less value than it used to be. There's still reasons to use it. One is to kind of hide your presence on a public net. If you're sitting in a coffee shop and you're not using a VPN, people can see your machine there and can attack it or attempt to attack yeah. it. Uh, there's also the geographic thing where if you want to watch Netflix in Japan, a VPN can let you do that. But if you're at home, yeah, you don't need a VPN. Well, that's, that's helpful. I mean... I'm in a hotel once a month, and I, I've kept a VPN just to use it there. But that's that's helpful, and so thank you. Yeah, I think if you're in a public place, there are arguments that you still need it. I'll put a link in the show notes, though, to Brian's article, because he makes a pretty good case. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you, Leo. Yeah, hey, thanks for the call. Thank you. Bye. Bye. But do 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 do
I mean, there's still reasons to use it, uh, which Brian didn't kind of um, talk about. But he says it's time to stop paying for a VPN. That also raises the issue of, you know, there are plenty of ways to do VPN-like stuff. You know, uh, Google uh, on Android has a VPN. Uh, Apple on iOS has a VPN private relay or VPN-like capabilities. So, I think a lot of the functionality that you absolutely had to have a VPN for in the past, uh, you don't really, you don't really need to anymore. He also raises the issue, which is legit, that, and I've always said, you know, can you trust your VPN? Remember, you can, you know, it's important that you trust your VPN provider. Because they do have, just like your ISP, they have access to everything. He says, some people still benefit from using a VPN, and not all providers are bad. At the very end, right? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Why, hey, hey, how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, journaling. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. There is a really good journaling program. I wanted to give them a little bit of a plug. I just love it. If you, if it was your New Year resolution to, I got to start keeping a journal, take a look. It's not free uh, at a program called Day One, D-A-Y-O-N-E app dot com. Uh, it's really pretty much iOS and Mac, although I, they used to have an Android version. I don't see it on their website anymore, so maybe that they have stopped trying to compete on Android. But if you're on iOS or, or Mac or both, just love uh, day one, dayoneapp.com. And it does some really cool things because journaling is hard. So, so it'll pull in your social media posts. It'll pull in your location. It'll even pull in the weather and start your daily journal post. They have prompts you can use. I just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those programs every, every year about this time, I, <laughs> I, st I start right around now. I start saying, oh, I really ought to be journaling. I just wish I had done this my whole life, and then I never get very, you know, five days, six days, and I'm done. People, people swear that journaling is a great thing, but uh, I don't, I don't have the discipline, I guess. Anyway, if, if there were one application to do it, this is, this is the one I wish I, you know, it's funny. I think they did have an Android and even a Windows version, and I think they've, must have discontinued those. Not free, by the way. Um, iPhone, iPad, Mac. There's even an Apple Watch version, but no. Uh, but it's all uh, it's all Apple. Oh, wait a minute. Day One Companion app is available for Android, so it's not as full featured, I guess. Day One Journal. They were bought recently by the folks that uh, do the WordPress software, Automatic, and uh, to me, that's good news. That means Day One will. Probably get some more resources put behind it. 8888 Ask Leo. Paul on the line from Columbus, Ohio. Hello, Paul. Leo Laporte here. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I am well. How are you? Oh, Happy New Year and all that good stuff. Thank you. Doing, you too. Doing okay. Doing okay. Uh, a couple of quickies for you, I hope. Um, this one issue has been going on for quite a while. I noticed and I thought it would clear up, and it hasn't. And that is when I want to listen to Twit the twit uh feed on the uh tune in on the a devices yes the echoes I it on yes the echoes <laughs> thank you for I not saying the a word. word we don't like to say that no, on the <laughs> i know i know but anyway anyway i can get it on one uh wireless device which is a polk sound bar that's connected to the tv okay okay and i can get it i can get it on the um Let's see the cube. Um, so you say uh, you say a word. I can't get it. On, I can't get it on a standalone like a device. Yeah, this drives this drives us in the podcast world crazy 
because the syntax is inconsistent. It's hard, you know, I like to listen to podcasts on these voice activated speakers, whether it's Google or Amazon, uh, because you just, you know, I'm shaving or whatever. And I say, hey, play the latest F1, you know, Formula One podcast. And, you know, about eight times out of 10, it'll do what I ask it to do. The other times it'll play something completely random or, and this is the most frustrating, I'll say, I have no idea what you're asking me for. And I don't think well, it's what I'm saying. It's not a... Yeah, this this is saying the A device says repeats the name Twit Twit Live and <laughs> says Twit Live not available. Yeah, even though you know it is because you're listening to it on another Alexa device somewhere else. Oh, I said the A word. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I knew what the answer uh, was. There isn't a set syntax. And I'll, by the way, I'll be uh, generous and say this isn't just for me and my podcasts, uh, sure. but this is for all podcasts. The syntax varies. Um, you're using TuneIn, so you can use a variety of different applications. More and more, these uh, uh, voice-activated speaker systems have allowed you to say, I want to use Spotify, or I want to use TuneIn, or I want to use mm -hmm. Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. And you can do that in the settings. So that's one thing you might want to do is look at different providers. It was for years, that's how you did it. You would say, Madam A, play Twit Live on TuneIn, and it would play. It works on the TuneIn app on my iPhone. I know, <laughs> I know. Well, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call and yell at uh, at the A people about that because I've got an issue with the Cube also. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't. It and seems that. like it feels like they've got different versions of the A, A word software on the Polk Bar and on the Cube than on the standalone devices. I would guess the standalone device is the most up to date because both Polk and the Fire Cube are made by not you know, made by well, Fire is made by Amazon, but I who knows? Yeah. I don't know. Well, switching over to the cube thing for a second, I love the device, visually impaired. It works usually great on everything now but uh, but sling. And it worked wonderfully on Sling until Sling said, oh, we have this wonderful new software yep. that we're going to do. And that was back in June. Yep. Since then, it has been total crap on Sling. <laughs> so it, it, that's the problem with all these streaming it. devices is they're, they're really not uh, – they're a computer that you install apps yeah. on. And when Sling, for instance, changes their apps, they can break it. And, it, and Amazon, has, you know, has no control over that, I guess. Um, yeah. Well, I've called both, and I've I said the person at uh, Sling said, "Well, you know, we're trying to do improvements all the time." I said, "Yeah, I understand." Yeah, you broke it. Look up the look up the definition of improvement. <laughs> it's not an improvement. It's not. <laughs> I mean, it was working, Leo. It was working perfectly. I, you could fast forward, do everything by voice, <laughs> and you'd say it'd get a specific channel went right to it. I can't. You can't even use the cursor manually and get to it and make it work right all the time. It's yeah. Stupid. But every every other app, Hulu, you know, Netflix, all of them are great except for this. Well, and to co further complicate matters, the software that's running on, uh, say, an Apple TV is probably very different than the software running on the Cube on the Fire TV. Well, um, I actually tried it on my on my Apple TV, and the Sling app is still a piece of crap. Same. <laughs> That's yeah. terrible there too, huh? Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, it's software. Uh, that's that's the real bottom line. And, uh, and what it's, other? What's an equivalent service besides uh, besides Sling that is reasonably priced? I know uh, YouTube sounds good, but it's expensive. It's not reasonably priced, but it's the best of the bunch, easily. Yeah. Um, Hulu Hulu also has has one. So I think they're the last men standing. The reason these are expensive is because the locals, you know, if you want live locals, oh, yeah. they they charge for these. And the price yeah, keeps like going up. They don't get any advertising, you know. It's oh, like gosh, they're yeah. Exposing their ads, ads to everybody. You'd think it's ways, free so. if you have an antenna. You're charging me to watch it on the Internet? What? Yeah, exactly. You'd no, I've think. got that. I've got, a, I've got a local antenna with a... With the uh, the A device, uh, can't think of the name of it off the top, but with the the antenna, the connect and all stuff, so I can record. Nice. Um, yeah, it works. That, that part works really good. I, I have to say, uh, I've said this before. We're in this kind of in between period 
where we've gone from live local broadcasters with antennas to cable, now over the top through the internet, and all three are jockeying for position. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. We're, <laughs> we're in this transition period, and even this even affects uh, the streaming devices that we use. It isn't settled yet. And so as a result, the experience changes. It's inconsistent. It doesn't work a lot of times. Um, that's just par for the course, uh, unfortunately. And it's too bad because I think if you could get something that was reasonably priced, that worked all the time, that was voice activated, if you could check all those boxes, you'd be very popular. But it just makes well, people crazy. Uh, it, yeah, the Cube itself works great on us. Loved the other Cube. App, and, yeah. As it did in Sling to begin with. Yeah. And then they had to try to get fancy or something. But the, it's Recast is what I couldn't think of. And I Recast, yes. And then hooked up yeah. to that. Yeah. And that works really well with, the, with the, all this stuff. It's quite nice. Uh, I don't have a solution for you. I think try different syntax with your Amazon Echo devices. Uh, the syntax seems to change. Why? I don't know. Try different sources, not just tune in. You know, try Spotify yeah. or uh, your podcast player, Google or uh, Apple. Um, until the, and, 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 just keep, and it changes. And what once worked, it drives us as podcasters, it drives us crazy. Because we would like to be, I would say, on every show... Hey, and if you want to listen to me on your Amazon Echo, say uh, play the Tech Guy podcast on Amazon Echo. And usually that works. But if it doesn't, then I'm going to get a lot of emails saying it doesn't work. And I don't want that either. But try it anyway. Pleasure talking to you, Paul. I appreciate your trying anyway. <laughs> trying trying to listen. YouTube TV is expensive. 65 bucks a month now. Um but I like, I just like it with the DVRs and stuff. I just really like it. I'm getting this close to cutting the cord on the cable. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's let's try it here. Uh, what what voice? What word? Who do I? Hey, computer. Echo, Melissa, Sam, play Twit Live on TuneIn. Twit Live from Leo's TuneIn. Live on TuneIn. Yeah, see, that worked. Twit Live from Leo's TuneIn. Live on TuneIn. Yeah, see, that worked. Live from Leo's tune. <laughs> yeah, see, that worked. Hey, Z stop. Micah remembered I'm using Ziggy. Oops. Hey, Z stop. There's a problem because Ziggy is close to Siri. So every time I say at home, I have. According to an Alexa Answers contributor, owners. Gulshan Kumar, Gulshan Kumar. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thanks for your feedback. <laughs> it really has become comical with these things. There's one episode of Succession, Lisa and I like Succession, and we like it so much we keep watching it over and over. <laughs> and there's one episode that we noticed every time we watch this episode, at one point in the episode, all of a sudden our Google device starts going on and on. It somehow gets triggered for something really long. It's really weird. It happened again the other night. <laughs> every time we watch, I think it's season three episode, uh, I think it's, it's the... Uh, Kendall's party episode. It triggers it. <sighs> Ziggy, play Twit Live on TuneIn. Twit Live from Leo's TuneIn. Play Twit Live on TuneIn. Hey, Ziggy, stop. See, that's the thing is I say, hey, you know, Siri, and that triggers Siri. So, but I forget that I don't have to say hey to Ziggy. I just say Ziggy. So I have to remember. So I'm sitting there because in my office at home, I have all three. I have Google, I have Echo, and I have Siri. I have all three sitting right there. And so I have to remember who's who 
<laughs> and if I say hey, both the Echo and the Siri perk up and try to do whatever I said. So it's quite comical, actually. Okay. Twit Live works on the newer ones, but not the Echo One. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and now our succession animated gif of the week <laughs> Leo Laporte the tech guy it actually has gotten to the point where it's kind of fun to tease your voice assistants <laughs> and tie them in knots this is exactly uh, what's wrong with Silicon Valley to be honest. They come up with something that has some promise, but it just doesn't work quite right, and then it gets worse, and it degrades over time, and then they have different versions, and it doesn't behave the same way as it used to, and pretty soon, you just throw your hands up in the air and say, I'm just going to go sit in the garden and read a book. 8888, ask Leo the phone number. Tom on the line from Richmond, California. Hi, Tom. Tom. Oh, Tom. Sorry, I had you on mute for there for a moment. Hi, yes, uh, from Richmond, and the your screener said, uh, "Oh, you're local." And I said, "Well, I used to live in Petaluma." Oh my, that's really local. The opportunity to come by your studio when when it's uh, tours or uh, as soon as the air clears, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we will reopen the studio. But uh, yeah, right, now, you know, it's funny we've been sh we've been shut down now for almost two years. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, hard to believe. Well, I'm glad to glad to meet a neighbor. Hello, Tom. My topic was a music player uh, other than iTunes, but I wanted to broaden it momentarily. I have Caliber, and I love it for ebooks. Caliber is an open source uh, book reader that not only lets you read ebooks, but lets you translate them from one format to another, from Amazon's Kindle format, for instance, uh, the Mobi format to the uh, open source standard EPUB and vice versa. Now, I just really think Caliber is a, a great free open source tool. The only thing lacking yeah. is it's a little funky looking. You know, it has that open source yeah. look. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. I can it, live it with also it. It plays PDFs. And, yeah. I mean, you can read PDFs. And, oh, I install it on every machine. I completely yeah. agree with you. Very nice to have. So, I'm spoiled. I'd love to have something like that. Uh, iTunes used to be good. It's a little bit more difficult now for cataloging and playing my own music because it's it's really geared toward pushing everyone toward buying streams. I isn't it annoying? Yeah, <sighs> workable. Uh, but I want to be able to have a firewall between music and non-music audio. Lectures, Spo uh, spoken word versus yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think I used to be able to do that sort of some kind of work around with iTunes. But I'm finding it pretty impossible. And I've well, it just depends how you play stuff. Do you just say play everything in my iTunes library? Because then you'll get whatever's there. But if you said play play classical music, uh, it wouldn't play. It shouldn't play any spoken word stuff. Well, I'm, I'm not sure about talking to it. I mean, I'm well, I don't. Well, you can talk to it, but uh, how, it, uh, you could trigger it by clicking as well. If you just, you know, open iTunes and say shuffle everything, yeah, you're going to get whatever's in there. That's why they give you playlists and genres and, and other things so that you can say, yeah. you know, click the thing that says, I just want, uh, you know, classic rock and roll, and it'll play that. Um, uh, the other choice would be to set you. The other choice would be to find something like Caliber for spoken word and get everything out of the iTunes library. Is that what you want to do? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there are um, a number of other tools for playing back stuff. It, are you on Windows or Mac? I'm on Mac. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a shame because this is another example of as soon as Apple started putting out a program to do this, all the great alternatives kind of disappeared i use something called vox v-o-x um, yeah, so yeah. and and that is a a music player it's at v-o-x dot rocks r-o-c-k-s it's a music player but you it will play back uh mp 
M, what are they? M4Bs, which is uh, how Apple designates audiobooks. It will play those back. Mm. It, it won't play back uh, copy protected stuff like Audible. So it depends where your spoken word's coming from. Apple will play copy protected Audible stuff back. But if, if the stuff you have is not copy protected, Vox might be a good choice. It has a cloud solution. It's actually a great music player because it'll play back high res music. It's kind of a nice, simple player. It's on the iPhone and on Macintosh. Um, so that's one I would take a, a look at, especially if you want to use the cloud. That It's free if you don't need their cloud, but the, uh, the, the, the way they get you is, uh, wouldn't you like to store everything in the cloud? Uh, which I do pay for. It's worth it. Uh, there are other choices. There are a number of ones, including Vox. Yeah. And I don't know if it was that one, but there was one of them that had, you know, has a free version. The paid version was $18 a month. Yeah, that's not. That might be Vox because they now have a streaming music service like everybody else. It's very, uh -huh. very frustrating. Um, like yeah. everybody else. Let me see. What are some other. Uh, it's, by the way, the mu streaming music service they sell is from France. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's Q O B U Z. You tell me how to pronounce it. Cubaz. Um so that's something new they just started doing. Let me think of what other music players there like as I said there used to be a lot. Uh does it have to work on iOS as well as Mac? Um what, what I want to do is be a a cataloger of what I have so that I can then uh export it one way or another right to the to the ios for uh got it yeah take there is an open source since you like caliber you might like clementine which is yeah clementine is an open source music player it's on ios and i think but it's definitely on mac windows and linux um i don't know if they're keeping it up to date it works pretty well it's named clementine after the orange so it has a cute little orange slice as its uh, icon and you know i don't think just because it hasn't been updated in a few years, I don't think there's anything wrong with that since music doesn't change a whole lot. And it is free. So that would be one to look at, Clementine. Um, it has the cataloging sure, Or do I get that over the web? Uh, it's, uh, I don't, it's not in the App Store, I don't think, yeah. Um, yeah, no results. <laughs> you can use it to store... Yeah, just look... Uh, I'm, let me see what the uh, web address is here, if I can find it for you. Uh, you can use it to store um, music. Uh, you can use uh, Dropbox or OneDrive with it, as well as Google Drive. I think there's some. I think there's some nice features to that one. I think just a Google search for Clementine will pull that one up. Anybody else have choices for their favorite? Let me know. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Um, let's see what's up up to date. Clementine is great, but I guess I guess it's a problem. It's clementine-player.org. Thank you, Micah. Clementine-player.org. Um, Vox is free for the basic stuff. It's it's definitely up to date. Let's see what else is out there. What you really what you really want is not so much a player as an organizer. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is kind of like our caller uh, in the first hour who wanted a photo organizer. Again, when Apple does it, it kind of takes the incentive out of, out of the, you know, it takes all the air out of the room and everybody says, well, I'm not going to try to enter that market. Apple's already out there. Um, I see a whole bunch of different choices. I, they may be out of date. I don't know. Um, here's an article at ltima.com, best music players for Mac. They have their own, of course, El Media, which is on the Mac App Store. I haven't tried it. E L M E D I A. That is on the Apple uh, Mac Store. Um, what was the name of that again? El Media. E L M, oh. like oh. Elm, but yeah. Edia, <laughs> or El Media. <laughs> I'm not sure which. Um, audio receiver. Media library, playlist features. It looks like it'll do all the things that you want. Um, for completely free, they mentioned VLC. I don't know if I'd recommend VLC. VSC is like kind of like Caliber. It's a it's a it's a video music player designed to handle every format known to man. Not the greatest interface, uh, but but it but it does work. 
Um, oh, here's one. Uh, Andy Anako loves Ina. I I N A. I I N A. Um, it's pretty basic, though. I don't think it. I don't know if it has the organizational tools you want. It looks like it's mostly a player. Anyway, there's some to ch to try. The El Media might be the one that looks pretty good. I'm gonna have to try it. There's a free version of that. Okay. Yeah, I'm downloading it now. Yeah, that looks pretty complete. Yeah. Yeah, because you just so the idea is I'll put all my spoken word stuff in here, and then it won't pollute my iTunes music. But if I want to listen to spoken word, just as if I want to read books, I go to Caliber. If I want to listen to spoken word, I'll listen on Vox or whatever. I have all my um, all my Audible books on Vox, but you have to co de, de copy protect them first. Mm -hmm. Which is well, I have that, but I have a ton of stuff that you know, audio, you know, MP3 is basically off of YouTube or right or various other sources that are lectures and one. Well, VLC is going to be great for that because it'll handle. You can throw anything at it, audio, video, any for, format at all, and it'll handle those. But it's organizational. It's pretty weak in the organizational things. It does have playlists mm -hmm. and it has folders and stuff like that. So it might be another one. If it might be sometimes video, sometimes audio, then VLC is probably a good choice. Yeah, the L Media looks actually titled as a video player, so it'll do both. Right. There's um, If you use Plex, I don't know if you've ever used Plex. Plex no. is a media server solution. People often run it on their... Um, network attached storage that uh, plays back all audio all content including audio and video and i've been watching with interest although it's oh, still early days uh, i've been watching a plex book player called book camp so you would store all of your uh books all of your content on a network device running plex and then it would serve it up. And in fact, it would even serve it up over the public internet. So you could be uh, walking around and, and you'd have a URL that you could go there. But Boot Camp is er, Book Camp rather, is early. And I've seen some people complaining about it. But I think in time, it might be a very good choice. That's bookcamp.app. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I gave uh, Tom a few more, a few more. A handful more music players for uh, Mac and iOS. There actually turns out to be more of them than I thought. Uh, when you know when Apple got in the business, a lot of them went away. But there's there's still some stuff out there. We'll put links to all of that in our show notes. Again, the show notes have changed a little bit. They're still at TechGuyLabs.com, but they're no longer on a dedicated site, and they look different. And I know that's disorienting to some of you. But here's what we've done: if you go to TechGuyLabs.com, it'll take you to our podcast network's site, twit.tv. Uh, this is episode 1,857, so you'll see all the uh, current episodes. You can click that link. Uh, it won't happen right away, but uh, our editors, as they as they you know, go through the show, will put all the links from the show, things like uh, the various audio players that I just mentioned to Tom, up on that website, so all the links will be there. There'll also be a link to a full transcript. Now, it takes a couple of days to get that up, but we do put a transcript of the show up there. That makes it easy to search through and find it, and of course, then there's audio and video of the show also a day or so later. So between the transcript and the audio and the video, I think you should be able to find everything that happens on the show. It's, it looks different, though, so I just wanted to warn you, that's that's the the change. TechGuyLabs.com, and we will have links to all of those various uh, audio apps uh, that Tom was looking for. 8888 Ask Leo, Dick D. Bartolo, the Gizwiz coming up in just a little bit. But right now, let's go back to the phones. Jim's on the line from L.A. Hello, Jim. Well, hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. I've been, listen I've been listening to Leo Laporte too long. <laughs> I, I go back to the Jeff Levy days and the early days of Leo Laporte. Twenty. It's now 20 eight years ago that I took over this show. Can well, you believe that? Not that can't be right. Eight. Wait a minute. 2004. That's 18 years ago. Feels like 28 years. 18 years well, ago. I, well, I just turned 80 last week. So, you know, I don't know where 80 years went. I know what you mean. You I'm just went zoom. I just turned 65. And, I, you know, when when you're 20, you think 80 is ancient. But uh, your mind, if you're lucky, is the same as it was when you were in your 20s. 
So you just wonder what the hell happened. <laughs> yeah, the, the mind wants to go do stuff. And yeah. The body says, I'm uh, still in bed. I'm in bed. <laughs> It's it's a very much I think young people and I mean anybody under say 50 or 60 I think they don't really understand it's not like you feel old all of a sudden you don't you just look old it sneaks up on you from behind it does <laughs> you know you're just you just minding your own business and the next thing you know you're blowing out 80 candles <laughs> Well, happy birthday. You, happy a birthday. Key. That's a good age. My mom just turned 89, and we have the same conversation. It's like, what happened? Did you ever think you'd have a son in his 60s? No. Hey, before we get to my subject, yes, you know, talking about that Amazon device. Well, mine used to be named, but there's this guy on the radio on Saturdays. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yes. And it would turn it on. So to be <laughs> sneaky, yes. I changed it to Echo. Yeah, and now I say yeah. Echo all the time. He doesn't say Echo <laughs> anymore. <laughs> now my dang Echo is talking. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm talking about her. <laughs> we, we have yet to solve this conundrum and feel really bad for anybody whose daughter is named A-L-E-X-A, right? Incidentally, oh, the, yes. the, the choice to name your kid... Uh, a L E X A has plummeted <laughs> over the last few years. <laughs> People have wised up to that. Yeah, but now I can call my device, and I, you might want to try this if you have a later model Amazon Echo. You can name him Ziggy, and uh, of course now I've just triggered all the people who were smart enough to take that name. Well, there's one problem with that. When you're 80 years old, remembering something that complicated <laughs> is not easy. Have I'd you, be calling it Fred and Ralph and Zebra and Zigolo and if you if, you, if you want to laugh, Saturday Night Live did a hysterical bit uh, about. Uh, they, I think they called it the Echo Silver, uh, Amazon Echo for seniors. Uh, that is just a hoot and a holler. Uh, highly recommend it. Yeah, Amazon Silver. Um, just, just watch it. And don't be insulted. I'll, I'll watch it and won't be insulted. Okay. All right. I, even though I'm old, I'm still adventurous. Yes. I have put Windows 11 on my computer. Good man. You're living in the future. My, oh yeah. My, my, my analysis is that they took Windows 10, Windows XP, and Windows 7 and said, what are we going to do with all these? Oh, let's put them all together. Put them in a blender. <laughs> that's my... That's you're my not far off. Of this thing so yeah, far. you're not far off. I have no idea why they did what they did because nothing is intuitive. Yeah. That's what I've discovered about it. It's not, in, it's not intuitive. Well, and this is always a problem when, when there's a up, big update uh, to the user interface of an operating system. Everybody's, you know, we've all got the muscle memory. We've learned how to use it, and now we've got to relearn it. And I think the only reason, honestly, to do that is, is it kind of anti-user. It's to sell more computers. Oh, I, you know, it's remember, we're old enough to remember them putting fins on cars, right? Because new cars, oh, yeah. the new model years, there wasn't much of a change. But what Detroit realized is if we make them look different, people, people will feel like, oh, I'm driving the old Cadillac. I need the one with fins. And the fins got bigger and bigger and weirder and weirder. And it was all really a psychology game to make you feel like you were using an obsolete vehicle. The vehicles were not obsolete. And any more than Windows XP or Windows 7 or Windows 10 is obsolete. But if we don't make it look yeah. new and fresh, nobody will want to buy a new computer. Well, you know, what's interesting is that all of the stuff is, as I've played with it now for a while, the stuff is all there. Yeah, you'll you get used to it. To find it. You'll get used to it. There's and, just this cognitive burden of having to retrain yourself. So, so the reason I wanted to talk about Windows is to tell people... It's going to be a bit of a shock when you first look at it yeah. and try to figure it out. But hang with it. Everything's there. <laughs> it's just it's just you may have to reach back into your XP or Windows 7 days and pull out a few nuggets here and there. Because 
that's what it kind of reminds me of is they're all lumped together. To paraphrase the late, great Microsoft, all of your capabilities are exactly where you left them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Windows 11 and truthfully, Windows 10 uh, under the hood are really essentially the same as Windows 7, Windows XP. There are a few changes, the driver model changes and stuff, but the basic underlying operating system is the same. What they're doing literally is putting fins on the Cadillac. They're moving things around. They're doing new capabilities. They're centering the start menu instead of having it on the left. They're moving the buttons on the windows to, to zoom them open and close them. And, and it, it's, uh, to mix my metaphors, it's moving the deck chairs in the Titanic. It doesn't well, add to the experience. Well, it, it, using your fins thing, yes. Windows 11 reminds me of the 59 Chevy where they <laughs> gave up putting the fins vertical and decided, let's put the fins horizontal. <laughs> That's basically it. The 59 Chevy. Yeah, for rounded, for, for fins, use rounded corners and you'll get the whole idea. It's cosmetic. Right. There's no need to upgrade to Windows 11. Eventually you will. Microsoft says we're going to support Windows 10 until 2025. We won't make anybody move. So you've got a few years. If you want to be, you know, hip and with it like Jim, go ahead and move. Because as Jim says, everything is still there it's just in a different spot kind of jim thank you for calling yeah, if you want if you, if you want to be adventurous go for it go for it that's what all that's how you say. stay young yeah. happy birthday leo, jim keep up the keep thank you keep up the good work thank you sir i appreciate it leo laporte the tech guy the gizwiz next that's a great call i completely agree completely agree I love it. The disco in those days, they had the swirling violins. I have to think that uh, these studio violin players are not in great demand as much as they were, really, in the, in the, in the disco days. There he is, Disco Dick D. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer and our gizmo wizard. Hello, Dickie D. How are you, pal? Very well. Happy New Year. Oh, and the same to you. Did you did you hang it around the house, or did you go to Times Square? <laughs> I, did you have a Times Square in Petaluma? I, I, I no, I did watch Anderson Cooper and uh, Andy Cohen get wasted. Oh my uh, gosh! And uh, and Andy Cohen, who is uh, I don't know who he is. He's a he's a, a B list celebrity, I guess. Got, yeah, got so drunk that he started yelling at the former mayor De Blasio. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Say, why are you dancing? Get off my stage. It was, it was, um, what, you know, one of those things you, you can't take your eyes off. It was kind of a car wreck, but uh, that was my New Year's Eve. And the nice thing is, living on the West Coast, that was at 9 p.m. So we could just, go, we watch the ball drop and go to bed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah, we do a New good. Year's uh, in Christmas kind of a thing. Did oh, you go down to Times Square? No, no, no. Wear we a do funny a little hat? thing. Yeah. We we do a little thing uh, over at Gizwiz TV for people who are home alone, and we just well, that's have nice. Some, you know, we used to do that. We did happen. on the podcast for a couple of years. Oh ago, my God! Used you to know, do 20, used to do twenty four hours. Twenty four hours of New Year's because it came from a time, and I was a little disappointed because we were watching Dick Clark's Rock and New Year's Eve, and it ends in the California at nine p.m. And then you go, well, now what do we want to do? So I thought, what if we did, because that happens everywhere, right? It's, it's, what if we did yeah. Happy New Year every hour on the hour for 24 hours and celebrate New Year's around the world? And that was exhausting, but it was a lot of fun. It was we great. raised $85,000 for UNICEF. Oh, um, so great. yeah, it was really fun. You came out for one of those, I think. Did you? I did. Yeah. I did do Really that. fun. We don't do that anymore. I'm too tired. No. So every <laughs> every okay. week. All right, so we're going to talk about CES 2022. Yeah, that's another thing you didn't do this year. No, well, Chad Johnson and our producer uh, Josh Cheney did go. They went. They went. How Not are they feeling? They... Are they okay? <laughs> so far, they're good. Wow. Uh, and at Showstoppers, uh, they carried me around on a laptop. Oh, so you got to so go I, virtually. I, exactly. Oh. I, I actually went to a bar in order to drink, and it was great. I could tell by their roaming around that attendance was way down. It seemed kind of quiet, yeah. 
Yeah, so actually CTA yesterday released the uh, figures. There were, a, it was a 75% drop in people. So it was a little more than 40,000. Oh, that's a big, I didn't realize it was that yeah. big a drop. It was wow. well over 40,000 uh, for this past CES that just ended. Whereas in 2020, the last full in person, well, it was 170,000. You and I were both there for that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. So, 40,000. I guess yeah. it'll be back next year, though, right? In full force. I, I, unless there's some variant that. <laughs> I didn't even want to think about it. That's not going to happen. No. So, no. no. So no. this is, we're talking about what would normally begin the year, the Consumer Electronics Show, it used to be called. And it's, it used to be a really a lot of fun. You see all sorts of gadgets. So did you find anything at CES this year? You know year? what? I've, I, I went to a million press conferences and got a, a trillion press releases. I found two things none of, neither one of us can use, but I thought are so clever. One is two guys who started a company. I don't know why they call it this. They call it spooky action. Spooky so action. They, that's spooky a physics action. That's a physics term. Oh, it is. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. So one thing that they're building that is wildly useful and successful is called the flying cell tower. <laughs> and it's spooky action at a distance. At a distance. So it's something that you bring to emergency areas where all cell phone oh, service is out. Cool. And then you fly a drone with a wire down to a truck that's powering it. And the guy said that it could stay up there for up to six days helping people get phone signals. They have one that they sell in Africa to hunt poachers. Oh, how interesting. This thing can really cover a lot of ground. A that portable ranges. cell tower. You know, they yeah, do. They've, I've seen those even at CES and other big trade shows when there's you know, 170,000 nerds coming. T-Mobile, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T all would bring big trucks with mobile cell towers. Yes, out. but this is a drone. Oh, it flies. It flies. Oh. That That's why it's so unique. The guy said it can pretty much fit in the trunk of almost any vehicle. So if you need wow. this as an emergency, I'm not sure if they're selling them or renting them, but on their website, it says, tell us what you need it for, and we can provide a quote uh, for what we can do with one of our drones. Wow. So I thought that was interesting. And the other very interesting thing was John Deere. They had a video, and I believe they have taken it from CES and put it on the, G the John Deere website. The farmer sitting in the farmhouse running his tractor which is autonomous and can run 24 7 if he needs it and as one of the spokespersons said the great thing about the autonomous tractor is if it sees something in its path it doesn't recognize it can just stop dead and not worrying about traffic piling up into the back of it because it's just running the farm by itself and John Deere is building 20 to 40 of them this year. and A self-driving tractor. And the A farmer can stay in the, stay in the farmhouse. In, in the farmhouse. It has six stereo cameras. It has light so it can run 24-7 if he wants. And he just controls it from his phone or his tablet. So <laughs> that's I hysterical. This, you know, that's a that perfect is, place for self-driving vehicles because... There's no other motorists you could run into or pedestrians. And, you know, the worst you could do is knock over some corn stalks. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Pretty cool. So, I thought they were neat. And then the other thing is, I'm, I'm getting more info. Well, do you know about why toothbrushes? Where no. you can brush all your teeth in 10 seconds? I only have uh, 43. So, all my teeth? Yes. Okay. In ten I, seconds, I don't think so. I said to the, I said to the CEO, I said, "Do you have one that works?" And he said, "Well, come by the booth and I'll let you use one." I'm thinking, even if I was there, no, I'm not gonna come. Yeah, I'm not gonna bad enough. Come. They got COVID yes. throughout the conference hall, but now you're going to share a toothbrush with some stranger. I don't think so. Yeah. Exactly. So what is it? It's got brushes for all the surfaces. So you yes, put this exactly. big thing in it, your it mouth. Ha it has like hundred and thirty thousand bristles. You put it in. <laughs> 
you bite down on the top and then you just you just move it back and for forth. For people who are really seconds. in a hurry. Really <laughs> a big hurry. Yes. Yeah. You take it out, you flip it over, and then you do the other set of teeth. Okay. Um, you yeah, know. I'm not I'm not a, I'm not rushing to buy I one. I don't mind taking uh, a couple of minutes every every morning and night brushing my teeth. I feel like yeah, I don't it's either. time well used. Time but if well you need one of these, it's y brush dot com. The letter Y on, or W H Y. The, the letter Y. Oh, okay. Dash brush. Y brush. Dot com. Dot com. Y brush. Y brush. Every year at CES, when you and I have gone, there has been something like this that's just kind of goofy and silly. Yeah. It just seems like that's kind of the thing. Actually, that's what they used to call us when we went to see. Yeah, oh, that goofy yeah, that's because we were there, goofy and silly. Dick D. Bartolo, his website gizwiz.biz. You'll have links to those and lots more great yes. gizmos and gadgets. Uh, also, the what the heck is a contest? Is it a brand new game? Yeah. Oh, how fun! Identify. And you were right. Everybody in the world knew the other one. It like was hundred people. Was it a ring that you wear and you squeeze it yeah, and the, squirts the, the guy? Yeah, the squirt yeah, ring. Yeah, 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 squirt exactly. ring. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I thought. This one's a little harder. Go there if if you can identify this gizmo or a gadget you might be in the running for an autographed copy of mad magazine gizwiz.biz thank you dickie d thank okay, you buddy take care everybody for joining me have a great geek week leo laporte the tech guy well that's it for the tech guy show for today thank you so much for being here and don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week at Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.